We're live. Okay, thank you. Moved by Councillor Jarvis, seconded by Councillor Wienko. Be it resolved that the Council of the Township of Georgia Bay rise from closed session at 1.56 p.m. without a report. All right, let me get the right one here. Without a report. All those in favor? And that is carried, thank you. And now we'll get back to the next item on our agenda, which we were halfway through staff reports when we broke for lunch. And so what we have is item E, which is financial services department, service limitations during winter months. And I'm not quite sure why it says financial services, but it does on the agenda. It does on the agenda. Sorry? But it's not. No, it's I, I think this is a, uh, it's Tony's report. Yes. And I don't think, uh, Chief Vandam, that you've volunteered to join the uh, financial department. You're muted, by the way. Chief, you're muted. There, how's that? That's better. OK, I said I'd have to take my shoes and socks off the count, so. <laughs> All right, All right, sir. Are we good to go then? We're good to go. Okay. So this th this report was uh, from uh, last council meeting where we were looking. Uh, the I was asked to look into purchasing snowmobiles and, and different options of trying to uh, provide a response to um, our citizens that are out on water access only properties and, and some of our cottage uh, private roads. Um, so with that in mind, we have been taking the steps of trying to secure uh, having conversation with our local businesses and residents to um, assist us like they have in the past. Um, we're doing a review of the liability and we've contacted our insurance company uh, with that. Um, definitely that the idea of the snowmobile uh, would help the situation. Um, but as we sat down and reviewed it even more, we have a, the use of a, um, an own an ATV and it was going to be a cheaper option to uh, purchase the tracks if we, uh, council's wishes to use that piece of equipment. We're still going to need our local um, marine operator to tell us um, where we can go and where we can't go as they're out on that ice every day and, and uh, monitoring the ice conditions and so forth. So it just give us that tool now that we can tow our toboggan to bring somebody in from those remote areas. Okay, um, and somewhere here, uh, I think you even attached a dollar amount, did you not? That is correct. It's it's not in this year's budget, and it's at this point hasn't been uh, proposed in the 2021 budget going forward either. All right, Councillor Douglas, I see your hand. Thank you. So, Tony, I'm just kind of curious, you're, you're saying that, uh, just for clarification here, that it's cheaper to go with a set of tracks for the ATV than to buy a snowmobile right now? That's correct. We already have a, a trailer that we can use. The tracks are, are approximately $5,000. If we buy a new Skidoo, uh, we need to get a trailer to tow it, and, and we're going to be over that, that threshold. Okay, so I just want to put a little bit of in, input into this. I've had ATV with tracks and I, I can tell you right now that the cost of maintaining them, uh, the accessibility to get them in places and speed over the ice, especially and weight, if you're dealing with a situation where you're on a little bit thinner ice, you don't have the same, it's, it's not quite the same. It would be really probably great for uh, land use. Um, not, not so much on the ice. And I've had years and years of experience with them. We finally gave up on the tracks, uh, just my opinion, but I think you'd be cheaper to get your snowmobile, get your trailer and have 
all the access and the speed that you actually would need for safety. But that's just my opinion. And, and point well taken. Um, we, we've looked at that. Uh, we've looked at Argos that if we broke through the ice, we would still float. The problem being is, is we're on a sled. We can't be going at a high rate of speed uh, anyways because of we're towing a patient uh, behind us on, on one of the toboggans. So points are, points are well taken. Um, trying to, I'm going to say, juggle all of the, the precautions and, and all of that. Um, I, I hear you and, and I, I don't have enough, I, I don't have another option at this point. Just, just supplementary to that other than us a little bit more money for you to get the right equipment personally. That would be I, my suggestion. I, I agree. The, the ultimate tool that would be a benefit to us would be a hovercraft. You're looking at about $150,000. If we looked at uh, sleds, we still have that, that fear of breaking through the ice um, and, and creating that health and safety concern. So that's why we need the expertise of our local uh, marinas and, and uh, people to help us to navigate through those um, areas. And we've also looked at the, the cost of a, an Argo that if we broke through the ice, we would definitely be able at least to, to stay afloat um, and perform uh, another rescue to do that. So there's a number of options and our goal at this point is at $37,000. So um, yeah, I don't know what the answer is going to be. A, we, it would be nice to have everything, but we have to be respectful of the, of the person's uh, tax dollars and their health and safety as well. Um, okay. Hang on here. I'm going to have to start. Hands are going up. I already saw Councillor Uyanko. I see Bocek, and I think I saw Cooper. And I also see CO Gunby, and she gets upset if I don't recognize her presence. So CO <laughs> Gunby first. Thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to sort of uh, to outline to members of council that as a CAO, and also maybe not someone who snowmobiles, I'm not comfortable having any staff member or volunteer firefighter or a member of the public on a snowmobile going over the ice in the wintertime. You have no idea what can happen, and I've only heard nothing but horrible things about accidents happening out there. So if the fire chief is recommending that um, tracks on the ATV is suitable for this time, then I fully support that. And this funding could also come out of the, uh, the COVID-19 funding that we received. Mm -hmm. like that idea. Councillor Bianco. I'm just a bit of a sidebar here, and it goes back to the last issue about the rinks and so on. Uh, I guess Jennifer might be on. I don't know if Jennifer, maybe uh, uh, Jessica knows. There was a survey done earlier, about a couple of months ago, about the number of people who are staying up this winter. Uh, it kind of goes to the idea of who's going to be up here and so on. Are there any statistics that come out of that uh, about how many people are staying up here for the winter and how many people are staying up in the bay and so on? It was three, Your Worship. It was uh, quite low. It was 17% of the uh, residents surveyed said that they were going to be up here for the winter. And no breakdown of where they live? Water access? No, but uh, access. I know that... No, I... I we are desperately looking for that data from the survey. I know that the Georgian Bay residents were a huge influence on the uh, population of that survey. So uh, I've gotten nowhere trying to get the data. So I know Jess is working hard at trying to get it so that we can answer those questions. But overall, 17% of residents are uh, staying up here for the winter. Truthfully, Councillor Wanko, I don't think that those numbers represent what we see even in residences like Obey, the majority of the residents are there, and that's a population where mostly 60% of them are uh, head to south. So I think the survey is rep misrepresentative of what uh, what's going here on land access facilities anyways. Okay, Councillor Bochuk, I believe, was next. So, Tony, thank you for the report. Um, you know... The ATV with the tracks on it is going to give accessibility to a lot of our residents, a lot of our constituents. We have a ton of private roads, Six Mile Lake, Gloucester Pool, Little Lake, um, even down into Honey Harbor that aren't plowed in the wintertime. And I would imagine that the majority of the people that have decided to come up from the city 
spend the winter here are not going out to the islands. They're a little smarter than that. Uh, and there's very uh, small envelope that the residents that live on islands can actually get out and back. It, 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 because you have freeze up and thaw. So I applaud the, um, the fact that we're going to be able to reach most using these tracks. And you have a contingency plan through uh, our local um, taxis and, and, and local seafaring folk that get out there and know their way around with hovercrafts and scoots and, and snowmobiles. So I think with the task you were given, you've come up with a fairly good uh, solution here that's going to reach the, ma the majority of the residents that are going to be staying up here for the winter. So I, I fully support this, but in no way, shape or form do I think we stop here. Um, uh, depending on, on what happens with the pandemic and that, I think we move forward and look at other avenues future budgets um, to, to do something to equip you properly to get to your residence. It's all about service. So uh, I do support uh, your report. Councillor Cooper. Uh, at risk of repeating some of what was just said, I, I, I certainly agree. Um, the solution sounds very good. And uh, I was going to comment now that Brian has made it, uh, this comment that uh, there are, uh, compared to three or five years ago, there's quite a few hovercraft, uh, certainly for Georgian Bay, that, that can be hired. And uh, I know about scoots, of course, but hovercraft is a very uh, safe craft uh, and can, some of them are quite big, and there's a few of them that are, you know, seat six or seven people, so, and can take somebody on a, on a, a stretcher. So I, I think though those services are available as i understand it tony i'm sure you're aware of that too but i just encourage that that that's the right way to get out um into georgian bay or any of the areas that might have this type of equipment and um, thank you um i'm going to read the resolution just so we know what we're talking about here and i'm going to get our ceo to add a sentence for me at the end um because or maybe you'll do it right now because you've appeared you mentioned COVID funding? Yes. So um, we were given a certain amount of money, which the amount is leaving me. Maybe Julie can let me know. Um, but this is something that could be taken care of under that fund as because we have more people in our municipality due to COVID, uh, it can be covered under that fund. You're shaking your head. You shaking I don't head? like when you shake your head. Um, I would just like to correct that um, the infrastructure, uh, the money that we received was for operational uh, mm -hmm. matters, and this is a capital nature oh. item. So yeah. no, that would not fall under that COVID funding received. However, there is a new stream we just learned about, and uh, we will be discussing at the senior management level what we could do with that stream. Um, but this would be a project. So the new stream is up to $100,000 hundred thousand dollars it's application based and it's for infrastructure so this is a new stream that we have not discussed yet um, that has just uh, appeared in our inboxes uh, late last week okay so that still so that still is possible that we could get some covid funding for this equipment that is now c coming before us because of the consequences of covid namely more people staying at uh, harder to access residences this year the resolution as it currently reads, moved by Councillor Jarvis, seconded by Councillor Rianco, be it resolved that Council authorizes the Director and Fire and Emergency Services to continue to investigate and report back to Council on possible means to respond to emergency calls on water access only properties and other access challenged properties. And that staff is to research the risks and liabilities associated with all response options and that staff continue to investigate and secure possible agreements with local residents and businesses to provide assistance in accessing remote properties, and that staff purchase a track system for all-terrain vehicle to assist with response to the remote areas within the township, and that the purchase be funded by, we can, we can either pick 2021 capital budget, which means it won't happen until January, or fire infrastructure reserve, which means it can happen now. Um, I don't know if we need to mention the COVID thing because if that comes along, that could also finance it. But so 
we're supposed to make a choice of whether if we're going to pay for it, we pay for it now or we pay for it in 2021 is really what it comes down to. Councillor Hazelton, followed by Councillor Jarvis. I guess we could also uh, direct our uh, CFO to uh, find the appropriate pot to get the money out of. So uh, that mm -hmm. would take the, uh, the choice uh, off the table and uh, delegate it to her. I would be comfortable with that. Um, also, I have a couple questions for uh, our fire chief. Um, uh, I don't know the answer to the question, so I'll ask it. Uh, is a if you knew the if you knew the answer, I'd really rather you didn't ask it. Thank you. <laughs> um, so you have volunteer fire fighters or uh, other uh, call it uh, non non permanent. I guess most of your your team are are in the volunteer ish or. Uh, occasional workers. I mean, if somebody is in a, in some sort of a standby mode, are they obligated to respond if there is a uh, call? No, there there is no. Uh, there's a moral obligation if you're available to respond, but there's nothing to uh, even um, with our partners that we use. There's nothing there that says uh, you can't drink on Saturday night when your friends come over because you potentially could be a um, emergency responder okay i was hoping that that was not the answer because i was thinking that uh in seeking relationships as you've got in that second and that clause um it might be useful to uh have relationships with uh, people that you can kind of set an expectation that you're going to call on them and that they need to be available but um, i'll leave that up to you that's all i just wanted to ask thank you i i i've been impressed on a few occasions that i've run into it that it's amazing the volunteerism you, you get um, from people willing to help, even though they're not official volunteer uh, on the force, um, that they're willing to offer their boats or their hovercraft or what have you. We, we have an amazing community that way. Councilor Jarvis. Most of my questions have been answered, but I like um, Councilor Hazelton's proposal that we uh, leave the uh, funding source for the track up to our uh, CFO at her discretion to take it from where it needs to be taken. Other than that, I'm, I'm in uh, agreement with this. I, I can't see us spending a lot of money. This COVID thing may, I mean, hopefully be over sooner than we think, but who knows, but uh, this may situation may be a little bit more temporary than we think. Who knows? <laughs> who knows? Ms. Booth, yeah. For your worship, um, I assisted in drafting the resolution with our fire chief, and uh, I think we need to expedite this sooner than later, and I think it should come out of the uh, reserve, the fire department infrastructure reserve, and if I'm going to do that, I need a resolution as per the municipal act, so it kind of has to be part of the, uh, the resolution. Okay. But then at the same time, we can leave it up to you if something else comes along to reimburse the reserve if i can put it that way sure okay councillor bocek i was going to suggest the same as julie did that it come out of the reserve and if we are fortunate to receive funding uh, i like councillor douglas's idea where we explore avenues to uh, use that funding that may possibly land in our laps for an argo or or something like that so my recommendation or what I just think that, you know, Tony's done a great job so far. Don't put the Argo thing out of your mind, because if we get some funding coming, it would be awful nice to, to have that information. So um, yeah, I look forward to hopefully we get this, uh, this track unit on right away. It's going to snow next week, you know, folks. Um, you, I'm not going to read the whole resolution again. You've heard it, but I'll, I'll have it now ending and that the purchase be funded by the Fire Infrastructure Reserve. All those in favor? All right, Chief Undum, you're going to get yourself a track system. Thank you, Council. Okay. Um, now we have a development services report on the environmental consultant services. And I see Ms. Lemieux, I'm gathering you're gonna to speak to this matter. Please yes. go ahead. 
Uh, good afternoon, Council. So the report in front of you, uh, Report 2020-077 for Development Services, uh, is just providing Council an overview of the results for our RFP um, that we issued uh, back in September of this year um, based on Council's support that we previously got um, to get some environmental consulting services for the Development Services Department, which is really exciting for us. Um, a quick overview in total, we did get 11 um, complete uh, completed submissions, which was which was great, and uh, we are recommending to award the main contract to uh, Hutchison Environmental Sciences Limited um, as the primary consultant, with SLR Consulting being the alternate based on the scoring that we achieved. Uh, again, so the resolution in front of council is essentially just acknowledging that staff will be awarding these contracts, and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Lemieux. Um, I think this is a, a very good report in that uh, what I like is a couple of things. One is we sometimes forget, I mean, as council, we sometimes forget, nor as residents, that planners are professionals and it's their job to analyze things per the planning laws, the planning rules, and give us their opinion on that. But sometimes that handcuffs them a little bit. And I believe that having an environmental consultant on board will remove those handcuffs. And that therefore a report can have both a planning and an environmental perspective on it. And I think that is going a significant step in the right direction. Um, I also want to comment that I, uh, I thank uh, both um, Ms. Lemieux and Ms. Gunby for bringing this report forward because in reality, uh, staffing is not the responsibility of the council. We, we, we as council hire the CAO and she then takes care of everything else. But I think it's very good that you brought this forward because you know how important this is to council. With that, Councillor Cooper wants to make a comment followed by Councillor Rianco. Certainly want to thank for the thank you, uh, Victoria, for the report and and uh, encourage that we have um, moved in this direction. I am encouraged that we've moved in this direction. I do have a couple of questions. Um, one of which is, uh, and I think I sort of communicated with both you and the CAO regarding the need to be mindful of a firm that has both environmental consultants and environmental engineers because they're very different skill sets. Um, and I wanted to hear your response to that is, I'm not aware that Hutchison uh, is able to cover off both sides of it. I'm well aware of SLR, they're a huge international firm, but um, can you respond to that first question? And I have a second follow-up question. Absolutely, uh, through your worship to Councillor Cooper, uh, that's a great question. Um, the uh, review um, did result in Hutchinson, you know, as an overview, being able to um, handle the most amount of uh, tasks that we would need. And that is why also SLR was the alternate, um, given those more engineering type of um, scenarios that we may need, not as frequently um, that we may need, but um, also I am aware that Hutchinson has um, quite a few relationships with other firms if needed to subcontract out for those services, but we are intending to um, heavily more rely on SLR for more engineering type of scenarios if, if uh, we ever needed that based on a site specific project, for instance. Thank you, and I just wanted to follow up. So, but your answer is that uh, Hutchison is environmental consulting, not engineering, is that correct? Uh, through your worship, that's my general understanding from my review of their submitted proposal. Yes. And and could you respond with respect to the SLR? They're strictly. I, I didn't realize that they're strictly engineering. Are they not also in the environmental consulting area? They no, they absolutely are. Um, but based on the uh, the grading system that we came up with through the proposal, um, Hutchison did score higher for um, the majority of the items, which were more environmental based. So that's just where the scoring laid. Um, but I, I'm quite um, excited to work with both of these firms because I think they're going to provide some really great uh, expertise for the township. Uh, all right, and uh, I'm sorry to continue on here, but the scoring system looks like it's financially related. Is there something else that I'm missing here? 
Uh, through your worship, yes, sorry. So that was the fun, the the uh, scoring that I included in the report was just for the top three um, scoring after the rest of the, so essentially we took the 11 firms mm. and then we put it through the entire um, scoring system. Let me just pull out my notes here. Um, and this is something that I have no problem circling to council if you would be interested to see how that was done. Um, but that was based on the, overview of the proposals, you know, the services provided, um, their office locations, things like that. And then once we found the top three of those, then we looked at the, essentially the fees and the financial costs associated with that. So that was kind of our way to um, push forward the the top um, out of the, the three highest scoring. So hopefully that helps your question. You know, you've answered that beautifully and thank you. And I'm delighted to hear what, what's, what the system was because it was a little bit, wasn't quite clear here, but the final caution I make uh, is that, um, and I'm gonna try and put this as diplomatically as possible, but um, there is a bit of a local old boys network. And I think we need to keep that in the back of our minds. Um, and that's why I like to see an international firm where it's, there's maybe more objectivity. So I just caution you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rianco. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I've known uh, Neil for quite a few years and I've, I've actually done some work with him on the work I do, but he's a go-to guy for the district. Uh, he was involved in the lake modeling work for the Muskoka Watershed Council. And uh, he knows Muskoka probably better than most consultants, especially when it comes to water quality work and so on. Um, my question to you, Vic, uh, Victoria, is Neil still working there? Like, I know that he has a, quite a diverse staff, but is he still working there? Uh, through your worship to Councilor Rianco, that's a great question. Um, the, the main point of contact through the proposal process for this was with uh, Andrea Smith, which was is a, a, a senior partner at the firm, I believe. Um, but I can get back to you on that. I, I'm not sure, um, but I can look back. Because, yeah. you know, I would really, I, I really think he made the right choice if, if Neil's involved because, say, he's, he's been around for a long, long time. And uh, so he would be, I, I like to see him involved in some of our work and, and not necessarily, I'm not, too familiar with his other staff, but I'd like to find out if he would be involved in this work. Councilor Jarvis. Quick, a quick one there for Victoria. There, I see 11 people put in applications. Um, but just curious to know the diversity of the other eight. Uh, were we, are we talking about again, international firms or were they all uh, people who decided they'd set up a firm just to do this RFP and they all lived in downtown Honey Harbor and uh, wanted the money? Uh, just curious. Uh, through your worship, that's a good question. I myself did not make a firm <laughs> just to get this bid. Uh, just kind of a quick overview. I would say, uh, you know, around two out of the 11 were more international based type of firms, ones with, you know, offices um, all throughout the country and internationally. Um, uh, I would say three of the, of the 11 were Muskoka based, uh, mostly in the Bracebridge area, and the rest were more GTA Hamilton, uh, Waterloo. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So nobody with a pickup truck and a, and a dog. No. Okay. Other than your application, of course. <laughs> That's a cat. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The, the, the resolution in front of me reads, moved by Councilor Rianco, seconded by Councilor Bocek, be it resolved, the council receives development service report 2020-077, and the council acknowledges that staff will award to Hutchinson Environmental Sciences Limited a contract to be the primary environmental consultant for the development service department for a two-year term with the opportunity for renewal at the discretion of council. And the council acknowledges that staff will enter into a contract with SLR Consulting to be the alternative environmental consultant for the development service department for a two year term with opportunity for renewal at the discretion of council. And I think it's quite significant that this resolution includes at the discretion of council. So we will be involved with as what happens in the future with these with this group. All those in favor. 
Now I'm seeing lots of hands. That is carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and Mayor, may I just make a comment before Victoria disappears? Um, I, I perhaps on behalf of all of council, thank you so much for uh, the work you have done on this and <clears throat> the fact that you have brought this to council for consideration uh, and that you have selected um, both a primary and a secondary um, consultant, uh, both with uh, very strong credentials that uh, should put us in good shape. This is a monumental step forward. And I think we all thank you very, very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that observation. You're absolutely, I agree with you 100%. Thank you, Ms. Lemieux, now that you're gone, or gone visually. All right, now we get to talk money. Ms. Boutiette, budget. Thank Go. you, Your Worship. <laughs> um, I would like to start by apologizing. I noticed that um, attachment one um, does not have a revised date, nor does it say draft two, but it should. Um, these are updated numbers. Um, I've used the same template, obviously, and I didn't change the date nor the, the, uh, the number of, of the uh, draft. Um, the resolution before you today gives a, a, multi, uh, a variety of options of where um, money uh, could be saved. Um, so we're looking uh, in line with council direction. Um, we're looking at anywhere between saving $110,000 and uh, $600,000, which is the amount that can be taken from um, the working fund reserve. Uh, therefore, I don't know if council has specific questions or if we're just jumping into the different options that I have ready on the spreadsheet and we could do a, a total. I'm wondering if I could. Um, Councilor Jarvis introduced an item um, under new business uh, on council remuneration, and I'm wondering whether that should be part of this discussion as well. I, have, I don't know what the dollar amount would be. Yeah, that's what I would like to know, and I have no objection to bringing it into this. So through you, Your Worship, uh, the dollar amount, uh, so the... Re Council remuneration bylaw states that it, it's determined at year end what the increase in council wages are mm -hmm. and to a maximum of 2%. So we use the prior year's COLA. Uh, we don't anticipate that it will be 2% this year. Uh, however, we do, uh, for budgeting purposes, use the 2% as a mark, and that is an equivalency of $4,600. For the all, all entire council? The 2% increase totals $4,600. Okay. Thank you. That means that each councillor will be giving up roughly $500. Just let me comment. It's more, uh, it's more a sign of solidarity with everybody else than anything else. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, um, and, and I'm looking to the rest of the councillor, whether we should resolve one way or another uh, the proposal of Councillor Jarvis, and then if, and if we decide to uh, follow his recommendation, um, then we have the first four and a half thousand, four thousand six hundred dollars of the amount we're looking for. Councillor Hazelton. Um, Julie, I just have a question for you, um, but it relates to what uh, the mayor is talking about here. Um, in your spreadsheet on page 124 of the package, it talks about salaries and benefits for, <clears throat> for council, and it shows the number of 13,600 as the variance between um, 2021 and 2020, um, but you've come up with a number of 4,000, and I'm confused. Sure, um, I do have that explanation. So uh, prior in prior years, the council stipend for IT was budgeted in the IT budget. However, in actuality, it just 
is easier for us to account for it in council remuneration because it is a taxable benefit and you guys get money paid for it. So we've just moved that um, stipend over into salaries and budgets. So it, it's really a nil impact on the overall budget. It's out of the IT budget and into the council budget. Thank you. And uh, f further to uh, Mayor, what you were suggesting, I'm fully supportive of dealing with uh, Councillor Jarvis's uh, recommendation. So Councillor Jarvis, I don't know if you have to make much more of a presentation, but it was your item of 10B. Is there anything else you want to add? No, I think it's pretty much been said. I would like to put a motion to the floor for the council to consider uh, that we uh, forego our uh, increase for uh, the next year or something along those lines. Councillor Wienko. Probably in this budget, I wouldn't support it because we're trying to get down to a zero budget. And um, I don't think that's reasonable. I think if we're at like talking about an 8% budget and we're trying to whittle it down, yeah, I could give up my 500 bucks. But just to uh, get to a, a zero increase budget, no, I think a lot of us are way underpaid. We do a lot of work and go through a lot of stress. Um, my costs are going up for, for Wi-Fi this year. Um, I have... I put a lot of miles on my truck every year. I don't get paid for that. Five hundred dollars doesn't make much difference to me, but I think it's a principle that uh, uh, I, I think we need to get paid for what we do. And um, if we're going for a zero budget, I'm not going to give up my salary just just to uh, to get to a zero budget. Councillor Cooper. I think um, for $500, I'd be more than pleased to forego the increase. I think it demonstrates our in interest in uh, being very careful about the financial finances of our corporation. And, and uh, frankly, we've got a lot of numbers to deal with here today. And uh, this is a good demonstration as a start. And I will remind us all that given the circumstances that we're in at the moment with respect to legal challenges that are significant, hugely significant from a financial perspective and otherwise, um, this doesn't really reflect on that aspect very much. I'm sure we have some money set aside, but nothing compared to what we're really gonna be spending. So we need to look for money anywhere we can find it. That's just a bottom line for me. And uh, if Julie disagrees with that, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing, but I think we have, uh, we're facing some pretty serious financial issues this year. Councillor Douglas. I think I think along the same line as uh, Councillor Wienko on this one, I, um, if we're trying to save money, I would say we should be looking at where some of our legal costs are going that are unnecessarily going out the door. I, I, like I, I think we all work really hard for our money. Our costs are going up, the fuel costs for running the trucks and so on. And I think, uh, I think our constituents would agree that you know what we do for them is significant and if anywhere we want to try and save some money it would be so much more if we could get the legal fees of some of these really unnecessary things that are going on to stop. Councilor Rochuk. Uh, yeah I see a little bit of a dilemma here I know I've been on council now for six years and um, as well as Mr. Cooper and, and, and Ms. Douglas and Paul Wienkel, um, we took a pretty big hit that probably you guys don't know about. Uh, one third of our councillors' remuneration was tax free. And the Ontario government took that away from us and we got a small increase to compensate for that. Um, I, I do agree that the costs have gone up, especially getting out and visiting constituents. I can't I can't lie, I haven't been out this year visiting constituents because of the, the pandemic. But understand that my constituents, some live on the Severn River, which means I have to get in my car, put my boat on a trailer, go up, launch it, go up the river, go see these people's problems and come back. Um, basically, councillor remuneration is to take care of your expenses and not 
for profit, not, not for income. Uh, we do this on a voluntary basis and we're, we're, we're volunteer counselors. The money is to cover our expenses. As I go over my expenses, as I think most of us do our due diligence, um, we're in a, I'm in a shortfall. I always have been for six years. I've been in a shortfall and I talk to counselors from other areas that get remunerated for their work, say as close as Barry, that make five times as much as we do. Um, but I do sympathize. We're in times where we need funding to, to go other ways. So I'm not going to make a decision until the very end here. I, I, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm going to hold off my thoughts and I'll make a decision at the end. This was kind of sprung on me. Uh, and I understand Councillor Jarvis, it was just today or yesterday you put in this resolution. I haven't really had time to digest it fully, but I don't like taking money out of my pocket to do my volunteer job. I think that's all I'm going to say on the matter. And, and thanks for the time on that. Councillor Jarvis, did you see, do you have your hand up there? Yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little surprised two things. One, I have mentioned this at at least two other council meetings in the past. So it shouldn't be new to anybody that this has been my thinking. Um, however, I've never put a motion on the floor. Uh, so definitely not that way. Um, I, I think uh, I understand that there are expenses. It's very difficult. I mean, it's very expensive for us to run our boats into a council meetings. We haven't had that expense this year. Um, I think expenses generally, I can't believe that uh, expenses haven't been down this year compared to past years because of the COVID situation. Uh, merely by fact that we don't have to travel to uh, council chambers for our meetings. Uh, gas prices are down. Cost of uh, borrowing money is down. Uh, the amount of money we'd be giving up is a token, uh, but by the same, uh, same way, it's also an indication to our community that we're willing to tell, tighten our belts on their behalf. I don't see how this could be anything more than a very good principled decision by us to help out our community, period. Um, we, we look at this again every year, I look at it again next year, the amount, the increase is minimal again, and uh, I, I think we've got to show people that we're trying to make an effort here, and that's one way to do it. I don't have much more to say to that. Thank you. You guys got me. Thank you. I just wanted to remind council that Ms. Bootsy had prepared a report with 14 recommendations to go over. So I do hope that all 14 don't take this long to discuss. Um, we can't predict that. I'm, I'm going to decide to not call the vote on this as of yet. And the reason is I clearly have a split council. I don't want to make the decision because if any vote I take will be a personal vote versus a council vote. And therefore, I'm going to postpone voting on this until we look at all the other items. Um, I thought there might have been a, a more common approach, and clearly there isn't. And therefore, I'd like to move us to move on to the, the larger items. Councillor Bocek, you want to add something in? No, no, okay. I just uh, I have a question of clarity. Okay. Um, is, is Councillor Jarvis, are you talking about? Oh, no, I'm going to ask uh, Julie. Julie, is council remuneration based on the term or the year? It's based on the bylaw that was passed. So it, yes. it keeps going up uh, with this COLA because the bylaw includes the COLA until a new bylaw is passed. So it's simply we be foregoing the cost of living allowance. Yes. Uh, oh. And, and if for, that for this year, the, if that the cost was of living allowance for this calendar year. Yeah. For 2021. Mr. Mayor, if you if you think it's split, I'm I'm going to I'm probably in favor of of, of this, um, being that it's just for this year and it's just the cola that we're talking about. But if we vote in favor of this, I want to make sure the message gets out to our constituents that we've done this. Okay, just one second here. You know. Oops. Hang on a second, I'll be back with you in a moment. I'm just doing my own, pretending I'm a, a, a um, if I understand, if my math is correct, and Ms. Boot yet may correct me, each counselor would be giving up $575 if COLA was a full 2%. Yes. 
That is correct. And the proportions are not actual because the mayor gets a bigger remuneration than the council members. So the mayor would actually be losing out more dollar value. I'd lose double. My salary is basically double, so I'd lose double. So we're looking at about $40 a month, Julie? 500 divided by 12? Uh, $48, and if you allow me to round up by eight cents, it'd be $48 a month um, if COLA is a full 2%, because we've maxed it out at 2%. So, so most of us are probably in a 40% tax bracket. So really the, the amount that we're going to be it's about $25 a month after taxes is what we're talking about. So yeah. I, I, I think it sets a good example and I think it really is going to mean a lot to our constituents if we move in this direction. Not that I don't need the money or want it or could use it. Councillor Douglas. Uh, well, it's not really a big dollar amount when you put it that way. So I suppose that actually does show a good Good show of faith. Um, I'm not so sure I like the way this is being presented, but on the other hand, when we're talking about $25 a month or whatever it is, it's really not very much. But I will I will say one thing. I don't like the way this is being presented as saving tax dollars because if we really wanna save tax dollars, we need to look at our legal fees and all the unnecessary lawsuits that are being thrown around. So for me, I would, I would agree to this, but not for the reasons that it's being, yeah. Okay. Um Ms. Way, had you drafted up a, um, a resolution I, I heard? It reads, be it resolved that council suspend the council remuneration quota increase for 2021. Be, Julie said that, yeah. Be, sorry? I'm sorry, be it resolved that? Council suspend the council remuneration quota increase for 2021. Okay. All those in favor? Oh, well, that passed unanimously. Wow, we only got- I'll try to use different phrasing next time. <laughs> Make it easier. Okay. All right. So now we have to go through this budget and figure, pick a bunch of items that we're gonna decide to um, forego in the coming year. So I have a very extensive resolution in front of me in which I have to tick off or X off various lines. Um, and then once, we, once we've gone through it once, we'll add up all the numbers and we'll see where we're at. So Ms. Boutiette, you have your calculator at hand. Okay. So the first item is library funding. To keep library funding at 2020 versus increasing it to the 2021 budget. And I don't think it, the number isn't in my resolution. Where is it on the schedule here? Your Worship, the, the value of savings to keep the amount the same is uh, $3,900. $3,900. So, Council, do we keep the budget for the library flat or do we give them the extra $3,900 that they normally would get? I'm seeing no, oh, Councillor Jarvis, I do see a hand. Of course, I'm on the library board. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, I, don't I, think you, I don't think you got significant remuneration from them. No, no, <laughs> no kickbacks, not in the way of books or anything. Um, I, I'm reluctant to reduce what they've been getting only by virtue of the fact that uh, in fact, because of COVID the expenses in, a, in, a, in certain ways are higher for the library as opposed to lower. Um, and I know that our, so our C, CEO, like whatever the position is, hasn't had um, an increase in a couple of years. So I would like to keep that uh, 
I would like to keep that increase in place. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, that's a thumbs up, Councillor Cooper, I presume. So let, let's leave that in place for now. Second one, reduce MacTier Community Development Association Gazebo acti Mrs. C Activity Park to, to $5,000. Councillor Cooper. Uh, you're muted. Sorry, I thought I'd hit it hard enough. Um, I just need to understand if we reduce it to 5,000, what have we saved? I, I'm not seeing those numbers here and I, I can't remember them all. So Julie, can you explain that to me? 35,000. Sorry? 35,000, the ask oh. was 40. Well, that's a significant amount of money which we're gonna have to find somewhere. So I, I um, anyway, I, I, I think it's something to, worthy of consideration. Thank you. Councilor Rianco. Can we go down to five, uh, 10,000 from, from 40? We can, we can pick any amount we want. Quite a, quite a bit of money. I think we're going and we're taking a little bit from everybody and that's a, that's a lot for one person. So can we say 10,000 instead of five? Sorry. So in other words, you're reduced, you're going from 40 down to 10,000. Correct. That would be my suggestion. Councilor Douglas. I would I would agree with that. I think ten thousand is a little bit fairer price, you know, sorry amount than forty thousand in this year, uh, given our situation. I, I think that the community would be happy to see the fund grow. Uh, it's not exactly what they need for what they want to do, but in in this time, we have to be as conservative as possible. We are looking for money, so I would agree. But, uh, I'd be happy to see it go to ten. Okay, council. How about 10? I see a couple nod head, head nods. Okay, let's do that for now. Cognition Community Church, dock replacement fund, funding to $5,000. Council Jarvis. You're muted, by the way. Sorry, right. uh, I thought, I think Cognition would be understanding in that. But what I don't understand is Cognizant uh, Cognizant Association has traditionally gotten a grant of 5,000 for the recreation program that's not listed here. Neither are any other recreation programs that I can see. Is the 5,000 dock replacement funding for the Cognizant Community Church in place of the $5,000 we would normally be giving them for the recreation program. There is a later line that says remove summer recreation grants of $5,000. So we'll get to that, the recreation grants a little bit later. Okay. They've never got $5,000 grants. No, they got 1,000. Oh, sorry, 1,000. Uh, thank you very much. You know, I have my numbers mixed up. Okay, fine. I'm okay. I, I think I, I think Agnesheen would understand the uh, reduction. Councilor Cooper. Agree. Well, I, 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 I'm afraid I have a question. I mean, I, I think your original ask was open-ended, was it not? Um, and and I, I guess I'm a little bit concerned why we might want to give some money to the Cognizant Community Church Dock when I don't think we've given it to any other church docks, to the best of my knowledge. Council Jarvis. You know, I'll add to that. What, we're, what they're trying to do is replace all that uh, uh, foam that uh, we just heard about earlier today uh, in those docks. It might be setting a precedent by doing that. Uh, I will acknowledge that. Um, I like the idea that they're trying to replace all these, the foam in the docks. It's an expensive proposition. We all know that. I, I like the idea, but it is kind of very selective. Councillor Rianco followed by Councillor Cooper. Um, I can support this, but just for one year. Because I don't want them coming back with five thousand every year until you get all the money for the docks. So I think a one-off. I think years ago we did do something for Six Mile Lake on a dock uh, that uh, you know we did. So I have no problem with five thousand dollars for Cognizant Dock, but it's just a one-off. No more years. Councilor Cooper. Yeah, I'd just like to say that as I understand it, uh, this uh, dock replacement program to get rid of uh, foam is uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of over $100,000. And um, the other point I'll make, it's not just a, a, a church 
dock. It's really a community dock as well. The church shares these docks and its facility for annual meetings and, and so forth. So it's, uh, it's a bit like the one in Honey Harbor, Mayor puts here. Uh, in that sense. And so it is a community center in, in a way, and the church has been very generous in terms of allowing a variety of different activities uh, at this location for a large community of 600 seasonal residents who pay pretty high taxes. So I, I think this is uh, would be good of us to, to go in for this year. Thank you. Yeah, you made reference to Honey Harbor, where the Honey Harbor uh, Community Church replaced its docks. And I don't believe it approached the township for any funding of those docks. And that's that, and I'm thinking about the various other college associations and res, communities that I don't believe did the same thing. That's my, my comment. Ms. Ms. Boutiet, uh, uh, please remind me what was in your original budget for Cognachine Docks? 10,000. 10,000, okay. So, Council, I'm looking for a head nods, yay or nay, 5,000 to the Cognachine Dock. One, two, three, four. Okay, we got, well, we're going to, 5,000 goes to them. So we're, we're, okay. I'm trying to, we're, we're, so far we're up to $40,000 of savings, rounding. It's, it's, sorry? 30, uh, plus council is 39.6. Oh, plus council, true. Okay. Next one, GBGH hospital funding to 5,000. To the best of my knowledge in the past, we haven't given them any money and we're trying to change that. But Councillor Rianko followed by Councillor Bocek. No, I don't think we should uh, start now doing it. Uh, we, we've, we've been asked for, I don't know how many years I've been on council, they've asked us every year, we've always turned them down. So I think we just got to keep that way. This is not a good year to start funding them. Councillor Bocek. I don't have an issue with, with eliminating this. We, we as council support Segbay Chamber of Commerce and the Segbay Chamber of Commerce each and every year does a golf tournament to support the hospital in the tune of 25,000 this year, 35,000 in each of the previous years. Um, and, and uh, we have to remember too that the GBGH is in Simcoe County. It's not in Muskoka. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things here. I, I think if we're looking to save, if we're looking for places to save, this will, might be one place to do it. You know, continue to support the community events that fund uh, the hospital indirectly. But I think I think um, in times like this, we we don't need to be doing this. So I'll leave it at that. Sorry, I was muted. We had 10,000 in, we have it reduced to five or reduced to zero. Council Jarvis. Um, notwithstanding Segbay's tremendous support over the years, I think uh, that is our hospital of choice when we use, uh, I know coming in from the lake, that that's the hospital people go to. Um, I know, because I was there this year. Um, and I, I would love it if we could reduce our funding to the hospitals in the district because this is the one that's more relevant to us. Uh, I'd like to support some funding to that to that hospital. So I'd be happy to forego ten and go with five, but I think we should be funding them. Just for your information, every single time that funding for hospitals comes up at district, I always make the point that they talk incessantly about Bracebridge and Huntsville. And yet a fair portion of our residents will never go to those yeah. hospitals and half of Gravenhurst residents don't go there. Um, and that I keep saying that fine, fund those hospitals, but save a piece for um, the hospitals that other portions of your residents go to. So, and that, that song won't end. Appreciate it. Councillor Cooper. And I think I saw Councillor Wanko, Bianco's hand again. So Cooper, the call uh, by Bianco. I, I agree with uh, Councillor Jarvis. This is sort of the, for the most part, the closest go-to hospital, whether it's um, Georgian Bay water access people, um, the south end of our 
south end of our uh, municipality and around Severn and so on. I know that Barrie is relatively close to, but this is the closest. And it, it, it's uh, really, um, uh, I, I think, worthy of supporting. And I, uh, the fact that we've reduced this amount is one, one thing, but I, I'd be against going to zero. So I, I support the recommendation here, but not to zero. Thank you. All right. So we had Councilor Yanko, sorry. I just want to, you should probably check with the district again, because I think we were successful in getting some district money to go towards uh, um, uh, uh, the Georgian Bay Hospital, I think possibly even Perry Sound. But I think we were successful, but maybe check with the district on that. Not, but again, uh, a lot more. of people around here, they don't go to Georgian Bay Hospital anymore. They, they go to Barry. They got all the, the cardiac stuff going on down there and so on. So I think a lot of people now are going down to Barry. It's Perry well, Sound. It's Perry Sound, not not uh, Midland. Yeah. Um, Are you saying Perry Sound got money in Midland? Are you sure? you're on that committee, so you know. Yeah. Okay. I I'm going to suggest because we have three options: the original ten, five, or zero. Five is in the middle, so we reduce it down to five and say five thousand for the hospital this year, and we'll see how it all works out. Georgian Bay forever, fighting phagmites for the health of wetlands and shorelands to 10,000. They've, they've, I think we put 20 in the original or was it 25? They've asked for 25. The original was 25 and the uh, alternative amount is 20. So it's the $5,000 savings. Um, no, you're talking about, I have two items here. One is GBF frag um, down to 10 and then um, for plastic diversion down to 10. So you're saying 10 plus 10 equals 20. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, apologies for that. So um, it would be to fund the organization 20,000 in total versus the 50 they asked in total. They asked and for 25 per initiative. Um, okay, maybe my memory's going. I thought they asked 25 plus 15. Today, today's ask was 25 plus 15. 15 was for the plastic collection. But what's more important is what did you have in the prior budget? In 25 and 25. And yes, there's been confusion here. I, I, I reviewed the ask like <laughs> multiple times and I I keep confusing myself. Okay. In the budget, there is 25 and 25. So the original, the current budget has 50. We can automatically reduce that down to 40 just because they've only asked for 40. So here, we've already saved 10. <laughs> Beautiful. There we go. So now the question is, council, we got 25 plus 15. Do you want to leave it at 25 plus 15? Do you want to make it 20 plus 10? Do you want to... Where, where do you want to go? Councillor Bocek, is your hand up? Yes. I'm in line with uh, 20 plus 10. Okay. Councillor Cooper, that's a thumbs up. Councillor Jarvis? To put it for clarification, what, what, what did these two uh, efforts get last year or for 2020? I, be, I believe it was 20,000 for frag and zero on plastic because this is a new endeavor. That's correct. So I think we should keep, if nothing else, we should keep frag where it was. And that was 20, I believe. Yeah. For, for Councillor Hazleton, you're yeah. probably going to correct me. Uh, no, I just want to uh, offer that I would prefer to see a 25 for the frag and five for the plastics. Plastics, a new initiative, the 25. Uh, allows them to bring in their uh, special machine to deal with Quarry Island. Uh, frag is something that if we don't stay on top of it, it gets out of control. Uh, plastics, yes, we need to deal with it, but um, it's not something that grows on its own. It's just us being nasty, uh, irresponsible people. So 
uh, my vote would be to uh, fully fund the frag uh, and partially fund the plastic. Thank you. Councilor Cooper. I wish Councilor Hazelton would speak for himself. <laughs> I thought he was. Wait a minute, I, I didn't buy a filter. I just didn't put it in yet. <laughs> Councilor Rienko. Oh, I keep hitting the wrong button. Yeah, no, I agree with uh, Councilor Hazelton. Uh, I think um, I'll need to keep the effort up on the frag uh, because actually the, you can see progress here. But this idea today about putting $15,000 into the plastic, I didn't get a really good warm feeling that that money was actually going to do anything useful in our township. So I think give them five for now and see how it goes for that. So I'll go along with the 25 total for the frag and plastics. Sorry, was that 20 for frag and five for plastic? Correct. That's what I would support. Yes. Okay. So that's 25 in total. I think Councillor Hazelton was 30 in total, if memory serves. No, he was 25. I think Councillor Hazelton is frozen on us. Yeah, I, I recall he said, keep it at uh, the frag at 25 so that they can do the work in Quarry Island and and the other five for the plastic. So that, that's what he was asking for, 30. And I think a couple of others of us have said a total of 30 to GBF. So uh, anyway, that's sort of where I'm at. Thank you. I'd like to hear from Council Hazelton if, if I'm wrong. He definitely was 25 on Frig. I'm quite certain of that. Yeah, and I believe he was 5,000 on the plastic. And Ms. Gundy's appeared. Yes, he was 25 and five. So 30. Yes. All right, let's, shall we agree to the 30, 25 plus five? Okay, so therefore, we're gonna ignore that and reduce funding for Georgian Bay divert and capture to $5,000. And that means compared to the original budget, we've now saved $20,000 on Georgian Bay forever because we've gone from 50 in the prior budget to 30 now. Georgian Bay Great Lakes Foundation to 20,000. Is that from 25,000, Julie? Yes, correct. Okay. And this is for the, the contract work they've been doing for us. Okay, Councillor Cooper. I'm hopeful that they could do it for 20,000. It's a, it's a very expansive program that covers a, a large geography uh, from 12 Mile Bay down to Severn Sound. So uh, I think it's worthy of uh, either keeping at 25 or maybe reducing to 20, but I think we have another opportunity in Honey Harbor with the uh, testing that SSEA is doing, which I think uh, uh, might uh, cover off most of this anyway. So I hope they can do it for 20, but I, I certainly wouldn't like to see it go any lower. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Rianco. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't recall getting a proposal from them during our budget process. And last year we, we gave them $20,000 and we were kind of under the impression that it was one off deal. So I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised they've come back for more, but I don't remember them coming back. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't seen any proposals from them this year, nor have I seen results from last year. Ms. Gunby. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. They were going to come back and report their results, but I just don't think that their results have been completed as of yet. But did they make an official request for 2021? Not that I've seen. So why have we got it in here then? Why are we giving money to people who haven't requested it yet? Because when we engaged them initially, we engaged them for not just this year, we spoke about this testing program going forward for several years. And it, it covers the only areas of Georgian Bay that are not covered by SSEA. So I think it's a very good investment and uh, I support it fully. And I know our communities up and down the shore do. So and I'm, I, I, I'll, I'll let other councillors uh, discuss that, but uh, I, I think it's a good value. Before you get it, and we haven't had a request yet. So, you know. But, but I think this was, this was a contract. I, I thought we'd. I, I thought, 
we'd, we'd hired them on a contract with a, with a renewal option. Councillor Bocek. I'm inclined to agree with uh, um, Chair Coetzer and, and, and Mr. Cooper. My recollection was at a council meeting because there was so many familiar names being thrown up with Dr. Pat Chow Frazier, et cetera. Uh, I do remember, and, and I had great faith in, in, the, in their ability to provide what they had uh, suggested they could provide. Um, and, and my understanding was that it was not 20,000, but 25,000 uh, that we agreed to as a council and, and that this would be an ongoing, um, an ongoing uh, event that we would fund each year. Um, so I thought that was in 2020, we made that decision, not 2019. So I'm a little bit miffed here. I thought we had agreed to the funding this year, this term already. Yeah, it was, it was this past winter, uh, it was a sort of a last minute opportunity that we, we approved and I thought it was with a, a renewal uh, option or understanding. That's my yeah, so So my, my feelings are, I think, this is probably one of the most valuable programs that we have currently running, very specific to a very specific target. And, and uh, so, yeah, I think if they can do it for 20,000 this year, we'll try and get it back up to the 25,000 next year. Uh, we have to explain our situation to them and just say, we really want you here. We're going to hit you a little bit this year, but we'll be back, you know, type of thing. I, I don't want to see this go away. I think this is of great value. All right, so shall we leave that reduced funding to 20,000? Okay. Um, remove contingencies of 6,000 for grants and donations. So that was just a, uh, a reserve for something that might come along that we don't foresee yet. Councilor Rianco. You're on mute, Councillor Rianco. Okay, this goes along with the valuation of grants of $5,000 for the inland, uh, uh, well, no, I guess it's for all of, uh, all of Georgian Bay. So basically for the, uh, the seasonal population. And I believe it was uh, Councillor Bocek uh, came online uh, uh, last term that he wanted a uh, fund put aside for non, uh, seasonal communities and so we put six thousand dollars in for grants and some of that's gone to uh mac -Tier and honey harbor groups and so on that are not on the various lakes so those two grants kind of go together um and i see that both suggesting removal but uh um i would be against the removal of the, of the recreational grants uh, because they're historical and the six thousand Brian, you're the one that wanted that. So I think you need to speak up on that one because that was for uh, some of the communities uh, like MacTier and Honey Harbor and Port 7 uh, uh, groups that needed funding to do their things. That is that is correct, uh, Councillor Wienko. Um, I think I made mention of the, the group of inlanders here, the homesteaders, we call them, that aren't seasonal residents, don't belong to a cottage association, but still would like uh, funding. I've spoken to them about our our cash crunch uh in the township uh last friday night and um they're 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 of a, an understanding so um from the port severn group that i was hoping that would take um some initiative and apply for this funding they've agreed that that they're not going to but that doesn't preclude max here or any other uh non-waterfront community from from asking for this as far as Port Severn goes, I'm uh, I'm 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 okay with anything that the rest of council wants to do with this with this funding because I know it's not coming here to Ward Three. Councillor Douglas, um, I, I'd be in agreement to cancel both of those for this year because, quite honestly, I don't think there's going to be any. Um, there's a good possibility that there just isn't going to be you know functions going on anyways. And I think it's one year that everyone would understand. I mean, that, you know, if we're pulling and clawing back in every way, 
that perhaps we're not going to have functions going on in 2021 at this point. Just a thought. But I'd like to see you come back for the following year. I don't want to see this as a permanent. Councilor Jarvis, followed by Councilor Cooper. Yeah, I, I'm going to I'm going to do what Councillor Douglas did and the others and group the two together: the uh, recreation grant and this. This one to me is sort of one of those things we should have as an essential backstop uh, for the local residents. And I don't, I would rather not remove it. I don't mind reducing it if that's okay with others. But I'd rather still see something on the books in case something comes up. Uh, I, I can I can truthfully say that the recreation grants for 2020 in Cognizine weren't used, so will be uh, bridged over into 2021. So I know that the CCA, while not real happy, will under, be understanding of, uh, of their uh, recreation grant being, uh, being reduced for next year. Councilor Cooper. Uh, might I suggest that we uh, reduce this by a little bit in each case, so maybe a, um, Four, uh, five, four, five thousand and four thousand. Um, I don't think many of the cottage associations actually collected on this on this uh, second portion, the five thousand, because they wouldn't have had programs. So um, well, that's, that's my question. Do we know if they collected in twenty twenty? I'm not one hundred percent sure. Your worship, they did. I did. Yeah, I'm aware the CCA did cash their check. Well, if, if they collected, then I think we should remove it for next year because they didn't offer the programs this year. Yeah, but the same That's what I'm saying is, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that they're comfortable holding it and using it next year. That would apply to any of those associations for the most part. They didn't have regattas. A lot of mm -hmm. the money goes out for $500 to cottage associations for regattas. They wouldn't have had uh, regattas. There wouldn't have been... Uh, the ability to social distance. So anyway, I, I in my I mean, we're skipping ahead, but I think the summer recreation grants make sense to remove because we they were in the 2020 budget and the money was probably spent, and yet they didn't was well, spent was sent out, and yet they didn't have their programs. Mm. No, I, I, I might I might differ with that, uh, Mr. Okay. Mayor. That. Um, I have a group, a cottage association that uh, does use the funding, um, uh, possibly two that did. I haven't checked with the other one, but I know one of my cottage associations did use uh, the funding. Paul, that's up there on Six Mile, correct? No, I don't think we applied this year because we only do it for regattas and we didn't have a regatta. So we okay. couldn't, we couldn't, in, we couldn't apply. The Gloucester, pool. the Gloucester pool decided against the regattas too. So. All right, I'm changing my mind. I think that we can probably forego the money and forego the uh, recreation grants as far as I'm concerned. Let's uh, let's make a statement here. We gave up, they're gonna have to give up. Let's balance this thing out the best we can have a 0% increase. Councilor Rianco. Well, they didn't use the money this year, but I'm hoping that that, uh, uh, that COG machine can have the swimming programs next year. Uh, we, we can have a regatta on our lake and other lakes and so on. So I, just because we didn't use it this year, I don't think they should be penalized for next year. You know, let's get back to normal. Hopefully by this time next year, we can have these regattas and so on. So let's, yeah. uh, let's be optimistic here and that uh, the money would be used. Maybe we could combine these two instead of having 11,000, say have 8,000 total for both right. inland communities and uh, also for... Uh, as you say, the homesteading community also pulls it out of that eight thousand dollar pot. So instead of eleven thousand, go down to eight thousand for next year. But I'm sure somebody's going to have to regatta, and I hope the swing program gets going up in Cog Machine because they need this money to run that program. I, I'm going to make a proposal, and that is that we remove the summer grant of five thousand. However, we give direction to Miss Butiet to find out last year where the $5,000 went. And what I'm meaning by that is, for instance, if last year Cognachine got their 1,000, this year they get nothing. If last year Six Mile Lake got nothing, this year they get their $1,000. In other words, if it, if it wasn't spent, if the 2020 money wasn't spent by an association, they can apply for it next year. But if they got it this year, they don't get it next year. That's my thought because 
if somebody like Cognachine got money this year for a program that didn't exist, then they should keep it in the bank for next year. It's tough telling people that they're not honest. You can't ask for money you didn't use. I don't think anybody's going to say that they they didn't have a regatta, but they get three thousand dollars anyway. I think you should tell people that they're being dishonest. Councillor Douglas. Um, I, I, I'm gonna. Well, I'd be very surprised. I think you had to have a, um, a program running or something to get that money. So I, what I'd really like to know from Ms. Boutiet is. Did we actually use that fund that we put aside last year for 2020? Mm. And if we didn't, where is it? It should still be sitting there somewhere. And if that's the case, then we really don't need to add to it for next year because we should have a full fund there for next year. That, that would be my take on this. And I mean, if we have, what is it, 5,000, Julie, that we usually put aside? There was the two amounts. Uh, one was just flagged as a contingency and the other one was the recreational grant program. Which is... Um, and usually how it works is if there's no resolution to transfer it into reserves to be used next year, it just flows into the general surplus and then flows into your uh, working capital uh, reserve. All right, you know, we spent a heck of a lot of time on this. Why don't we set this aside for now and get Ms. Booth yet to tell us who did or did not withdraw money? Because last year there was definitely a resolution where each person, each um, each group was approved for 500, 1,000, whatever it was. And we should be able to find out this year whether who, who did or did not collect on that. And, yeah, I, stand, I stand corrected. I'm, the Cognizant may not have spent their uh, okay. money. So I, I'm going to suggest if that's the case, if people didn't collect their money, then per Miss Boot yet, we should take the $5,000 unspent and transfer it into 2021, which means we don't have to put a new 5,000 in our budget. So all those in favor of removing the summer recreation grants of 5,000. All right, let's do that for now. Miss Gunby, you're not happy. Oh no, it's not that I'm not happy. I just wanted to advise council that uh, the deadline to apply for the grants is October 1st. So they would have been given the money likely before if not like the very beginning of January. Uh, but Mr. Sokatch is trying to find the information on his computer, but his computer is frozen. Okay. So we're for, for now, we're gonna remove it. We can always change our mind because we may discover that we've removed too much at the end of the day. Okay, so then back to the contingency for $6,000. Do you wanna leave that in for next year to support other groups or do we, want to take it out. Councillor Cooper. I would suggest that we leave some in there, but we need to take a bit of a bite. And I think um, Councillor Bocek has, a, has noted that uh, we might be able to um, reduce it somewhat. So I was going to suggest 4,000. Okay, head nods. Yeah, I agree, um, that, leaves, that leaves at least well, more than 50% of that fund in there to be used, so yeah. Okay, we're we gonna reduce contingency to 4,000. Okay. Next on the list, reduce council endeavors fund by 40,000. This is a fund I think that was at uh, 100,000. Yep. And reducing the 40,000, um, that means we're saving 60,000 if we accept this item. Compared to the prior budget, Ms. Booth, yet, is that correct? No, it states reduced by 40,000. So we'd be saving 40,000, leaving in 60, but we could do the reverse. It's okay. all up to you. Well, uh, thank you for that, that correction. So we'd set aside 100 and you're proposing reducing the 60, but we have to see where we're going. Councillor Jarvis, you've put your hand up, I think, three times now on this. Yeah, just a quick one uh, for our uh, CFO. Uh, of that uh, Endeavors Fund for 2020, how much have we spent? It was not a 2020 budget item. So we didn't even have, we didn't even have, this is a totally new, uh, oh. is So do we, and the premise for setting it up in the, was? 
I'm going to let Mayor Kuchar money. respond to that one. That we'd have some money available. So if unexpected things came along during the year that we thought was worth it, um, we'd say, okay, here's a reserve we could dip into. And if we didn't use it, it would be still in the bank at the end of the year. Um, okay. I, I have the sneaky suspicion this coming year, our legal fund will more than dip into this, whether we set it up or not. Councillor Rianko, I think I saw your hand. Well, I'm just wondering what it was for. So you're saying it's for possibly legal funds. Are you thinking Nacy Bay or something like that? Or, or is, that, is, is that in a separate account or other legal things? Well, I, I just, I, I'm just watching the, the number of, you know, things like LPAT appeals and the like that we're going to be facing and they all cost money. And therefore, I don't think, I don't think it makes but, sense. I mean, I offered to get rid of this entire fund last month and Ms. Boot yet wouldn't let me do it. But, but uh, the LPAT and all that is, is, is uh, budgeted under planning department, yes. is it not? So this is, this is additional to LPAT. So as Councillor uh, uh, Douglas said earlier, we've got to reduce our legal costs, um, mm -hmm. unnecessary legal costs. And I guess this is where the fund, this is where these funds would come from. So I'm all for reducing it. Councillor Cooper, I think I saw your hand. I was just trying to get clarification on on this uh, on, on the mayor's slush fund. I'm kidding. Um, I, so I'll live with that because I know I'm not be using it as slush. <laughs> but um, however, I think uh, it would be probably useful to to reduce it at least by forty thousand, if not more. I know that we need to, we are going to have some demands that are uh, associated, but a lot of it is related to LPAT. So. Um, I don't know that we probably have enough set aside in the planning area to, to handle what we have in front of us at the moment. Uh, so uh, anyway, long and short is, uh, I'd like to see this at least reduced by 40,000, if, if not more. Thank you. Any other, Councilor Bocek? There, there's always different avenues um, of, of, of looking where money hasn't been spent that's been allocated in order to facilitate things like legal costs and that we can switch things around a bit um i don't know it seems to be anywhere between 40 and 60 so if we left fifty thousand in there as a contingent that would give us fifty thousand dollars off of our dilemma here so i'm gonna put it out there that we reduce it by fifty thousand dollars okay I see thumbs up. It's been reduced by 50. Remove summer youth program outsourced for 30. I've forgotten. Can you please uh, remind me what this was? Yes, through your worship um, and Brad may be able to speak better, but we used to offer a, a fully staffed summer program. And for 2020, Brad had come forward with a report that says we should outsource it to an organization uh, and he gave the example, the YMCA. Um, however, we didn't end up offering that program in 2020 due to COVID. Um, so we're just wondering if we're in the business of offering summer youth program in its entirety. Um, if memory serves, this was the MACTEER program where we had real challenges in the past and we were staffing it ourselves. Yeah. Correct. So, yes, so this, that's right. So this, this is the MAC tier summer youth program that we're talking about right here. Council Jarvis. Once again, if we have funds from this year that were not used, we should, I mean, we don't need to have $60,000 next year. So let's just keep $30,000 that we didn't spend this year for next year. So that'd be a $30,000 reduction. They, uh, through your worship, the COVID savings were offset by COVID expenses and were pretty much flat, including the COVID operational grant of 300 and some thousand. Councilor Bochak. I vote we remove this completely from the budget. I don't think there's gonna be anything in 2021. I truly, they're talking about a vaccine maybe for late 2021. I don't see anybody out playing this year, running around in a rink. We've already said that we're looking at outdoor activities being canceled uh, in the winter time. 
Uh, unless Brad has something else to offer us in the way where we have commitments currently to something, I say we just ax this whole thing. Mr. Solcash, you're probably uh, appearing on recreation grants, weren't you? Yes, <clears throat> having, yes. Um, we do not have a commitment for the coming year. Uh, I haven't spoken to the YMCA for a while, which is a group that was somewhat interested in running a summer camp. Um, so if it was removed and never revisited from a personal standpoint, that would be great. Uh, from the community standpoint, um, I guess we'd have to wait and see if we get any feedback. Okay. Any other comments? I, I'm hoping I'm hoping to hear from either Councillors Douglas or Wienko because that's Mac Tears their corner neck of the woods. Councillor Wienko, followed by Councillor Douglas. I think we should be moving. I, I would be reluctant to make a decision at this time that there's going to be any type of program during next summer. I, I think we got to make a look, look to the future and say, is there a possibility that we would encourage people to get together next summer? At this point, I would say no. But I, I, we visited in, in, in 20, uh, uh, 2022, yes, but not, not for 21. Councilor Douglas. Uh, yeah, it's as I said earlier, I think with all these fundings, you know, for the recreation and furthermore, I just don't see anything really going on this year. Uh, and I, I think the public would fully understand what we're doing here, because even if we had a vaccine come out that we're, I can't see us getting to where we want to be anyways in 2021 mm -hmm. to be reviewed again in 2022, yeah. of course. But yeah, that's how right. I feel about that. Um, Mr. Sokash, what did you find out on recreation grants? Am I here? Yes. Yeah, yes, I'm here. Um, so they were distributed last year, and it looks like what some of the groups were doing is instead of using them to offset the cost that they'd already incurred, they would put them into their budget for the coming year. So oh. we were asked earlier this year if they could use the money that they've already received, or sorry, if the uh, what they should do with the money that they've already received. Uh, for the coming year, whereas it was actually to offset costs from 2019, not for costs to be incurred in 2020. Yeah, so, so we fund them after they've spent the money. That's correct, but from a budgeting standpoint, they look at it as revenues for the next year. Yeah, so we've paid them for 2019, we have not paid them anything for 2020 because they didn't apply for 2020. That is correct. Okay, so there what. The five thousand dollars that we allocated in twenty twenty will not be spent. That is correct, and if we're, we would just have to put it in the budget as a carry forward, I believe, Julie. So it's available for twenty twenty one. So I think we've removed it from the twenty twenty one budget because we've carried forward five from the twenty twenty. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Increased general tax levy by 1%, which by the way, with all the money that we have now, we don't have to do. And the reason I say that is when I'm looking at my list so far, we have 65, 70, 100, we're at about $150,000, are we not? We've already marked, so we don't have to increase the tax levy to balance the budget. Okay. I would be agreeable to that. Okay. Um, remove SSE Honey Harbor water monitoring funding of $19,050. Councillor Cooper. I've said this a couple of times and it's uh, no reflection on SSEA, but we do have a program we just discussed. Uh, we are doing testing throughout Honey Harbor we're going to be getting a report in the next few weeks from this organization. So I, I just, I don't see the reason to duplicate water testing and it may be slightly different testing, but I, I think uh, all in all, uh, we'd be wise to uh, uh, take this out. We're already spending close, it'll be close to $90,000 with SSEA this year anyway. So this is just a, an additional 
service that we requested from them. And I think we've uh, covered that off. So in, with respect to the uh, coastal waters of Georgian Bay, um, I, uh, I, I would suggest that we remove this completely. Thank you. Councilor Douglas, followed by Councilor Rianco. Well, I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't think we should be removing this at all. The SSCA does an, an amazing job in many fronts, not just covering off the program that we've now just added. Um, the intention in my view, when we added that program was not to replace SSEA. And uh, I'd like to hear from uh, Councillor Wyanko on this because from what I've seen in the recent seminar that they had, uh, they, they just do an amazing job at what they do. And I don't think we should be cutting funding for it at all. And especially in, the, in light of the fact that we brought on this other program, that in my view was not to replace this. Councillor Wyanko. Well, as first of all, I would be opposed to eliminate this unless, unless the local community wants it eliminated. Um, this $20,000 program, uh, if we were to run it separately for the, for the private consultant, um, as SSCA said, it would cost us over $60,000. So this is this, this program, we're saving $20,000 on this particular project. And the project itself was not related to water quality per se. It was based on the concerns of, um, uh, of, of potential algae blooms in either South Bay or North Bay. And uh, I think if we're going to cancel that project, I think we all should have uh, a presentation by the SSEA on this. And secondly, I would like to have an email from the Honey Harbor Association saying, they no, no longer want this particular program in South Bay and North Bay, then I would have no problem canceling it. But I, I think we have to hear from the community what they think and not uh, try to represent them uh, per, uh, per se. So again, I think the SSCA should have an opportunity to talk to us. And I'd like to have something from feedback from the Honey Harbor Association, what their feelings are on this particular project, because if there happens to be an algae bloom next year, the year after, whatever, people are going to say, well, why didn't you tell us if this is going to happen? So I think this is, this is a very sensitive project. For the amount of money that we're spending, we're getting $60,000 worth of data. I think it's also important um, that because we have not yet seen the report from uh, Georgia Bay Great Lakes Foundation, which I'm very much looking forward to, learning what data that, that they have learned is to see to what degree we are overlapping or not because I, I find it difficult for from my perspective to know how much they're overlap versus complementary I don't know um can I suggest oh sorry, sorry Council Hazelton sometimes your hand sort of fades when you put it in front so I can't always see it if I see two fingers I figure it's a hand <laughs> thank you <clears throat> thank you um so here is, uh, here is my concern in the uh, kind of, we'll call it Ward 4 area. Um, SSEA has been, doing, uh, has been doing water testing for, for a long time now in the uh, North Bay, South Bay. Um, we get occasional reports from them that there is blue-green algae uh, bloom subsurface. Um, and uh, I, at the beginning of my term here, uh, and have consistently asked for um, strategies that we can use to remediate the water quality issues. Um, and uh, I haven't heard anything on that front. Um, the, the concern though that I have is this, um, these, uh, these testing uh, locations that have been used um, are mid bay testing locations that uh, probably um, test for some uh, some good elements, um, but I have yet to hear anybody who is doing water quality testing to come forward and explain the relationship um, and the cause of the massive aquatic growth along the shoreline, along the bottoms, in front of all the properties in, uh, in the bays, North Bay and South Bay. And so... Um, in my opinion, what we need to do is um, perhaps pause the funding for one year, um, hopefully in the process, get their attention and say, look, 
Uh, we like what you've been doing. Uh, one year of not testing in our area isn't going to make any uh, difference, uh, good or bad, into what happens. But what we really need to be doing is getting you to refocus your energies on helping us understand the linkage between uh, the results that you've given us in the past, the massive aquatic uh, vegetation growth and algae growth that has been taking place in North and South Bay, uh, and give us uh, perhaps uh, a remediation strategy that we can be considering um, because quite frankly, the water quality and the, uh, the aquatic vegetation is out of control in North and South Bay. The algae growth in all the rocks is out of control. And the current program that is being done in North and South Bay by SSEA is doing nothing to guide us on how to correct these, uh, th this degeneration of water quality. So um, as I said, I, for, for two years now, I've asked for remediation strategies, but we're not getting them. So my, uh, my preference would be, let's just suspend that program for the year, save some money. But uh, given that they are our partner um, and they're doing all kinds of other things for us, um, let's impose on them to um, give us uh, a shifting focus on where else they actually can help us. And then I would be absolutely supportive of uh, assuming that support leads us in a good direction, providing that uh, funding for future years. Thank you. Councilor Rienko. Well, based on very similar comments uh, you made last year at this time, uh, SSEA did uh, uh, prepare a long article that was included in your hoots uh, last, um, I guess it was, I don't know when, when that came out, but the last issue of hoots has a large article in there from SSEA about uh, remedial ideas for various cottages. And, and so you did get some, some uh, feedback on that. You're saying that we should take a year off. Well, I think this year, they weren't able to do a lot of the water quality work because the labs at uh, Dorset were closed. So I don't know how much work they were able to do this year. So this is why I think they should come in, explain uh, what they did uh, this year, if anything. I know they've done something because they could probably do the algae work, but I don't know how much they did this year. So I think it'd be worthwhile for them to come in and, and say what they did. And then, you, then they can address your comments directly. But uh, to make a... Uh, uh, decision today about cutting these funds without their input and uh, it, from my opinion uh, the input of the larger community uh, I think we would be amiss there and uh, say it's only $20,000 but uh, I think we're jumping too, too quickly here and let, let them justify the program for next year. Councillor Cooper. Well, that's very interesting uh, information, Councilor Rianco, and therefore, if they did very little this year, they could go ahead and test next year, just move the money forward. Uh, but in addition to that, um, I, I would... They only charge what they did this year. They, did, they don't charge us the whole thing if they don't do the work, so they, they wouldn't have charged us for the water quality if they didn't do the water quality. So, so it's not in our budget and it may not be done next year either with, with as we've been talking about, uh, our recreation programs and so many other things. So I think we need to, A, get some justification. I think we need some answers to what Councillor Hazelton is suggesting. I was gonna also suggest that if we continue on with this program in Honey Harbor, that we take the, uh, some of the testing that's done in North Bay and South Bay from uh, the Great Lakes uh, group, Pat Chow Fraser, and uh, move it elsewhere. So that's another option. We've got lots of options in front of us. Thank you. Well, may I suggest that we hold this item, a decision on this item until next month, and we'll see what, whether we can get some inf more information from both groups for now. Last item, and, and by the way, we, we've been on this now for uh, well over an hour in this budget item, So, but I think we've made real headway, so I'm glad of that. Um, Remove the development of a community improvement plan, $30,000. I need a reminder again of this, what this community improvement plan was. 
through you, Your Worship, um, this is an item that was just brought forward uh, and possibly Jen Schneier, if she's on the line, could speak about it a little bit more. She doesn't appear to be here, okay. but I don't have enough information to explain this to you. Well, I know a bit about community improvement plans. I could speak about it in general. And so uh, usually when you apply for funding that's uh, economically develop economic development related, such as the Main Street funding that we would have gotten in 2018-2019, um, you're allowed to do specific things with that funding. And usually the window or the door is open uh, a lot wider when you do have a community improvement plan. So what a community improvement plan is, is having set policies for how you're going to assist business businesses. So a, a community improvement plan could have tax incentives for businesses or um, things of, of that nature or have even uh, regions that are already identified for improvements or grant eligibility. Um, and I see now that uh, Ms. Schneier has joined us. So um, hopefully she could shed a little bit more light on a community improvement plan um, and its benefits. Uh, thank you. The community improvement plan, I'm coming to council to talk to you about it. We've had some businesses reach out to us and ask if there was a community improvement plan available for to assist in some of the COVID related funding that they have to uh, sp spend money on. So for example, barriers at uh, cash registers at the Hive or at the town center would be an eligible expense for a CIP where we could do 50% funding as well. The exterior of buildings and some associated um, fees even related to COVID for shelters for people to wait outside for to get their commissary as well as uh, new stackable uh, racks inside their store because of spatial and social distance, uh, physical distancing that's had to occur. So I'm coming to council uh, for this request because it needs to be at the will of council as to whether we do or do not offer support for businesses. It would be a little progressive for us to do this at the same time we've started to hear of a need. We don't even do business licensing here at the municipality. We tend to leave the business community at, in the care of the chamber, but the chamber doesn't have funds for this and are, are ineligible to apply for funding. Um, there's not funding that supports small businesses to do COVID related expenses for some of the businesses that we have here. So the idea would be that it would be a program that we would return to you in 2021 and uh, provide guidelines and uh, parameters around creating a CIP program. So a CIP program, once it starts, it tends to be unable to be removed from your budget because uh, businesses tend to look at that in their future planning to know that they may be able to get access to 50% funding for exteriors of buildings. In this particular case, I'm coming to you because we've had some COVID related issues. Um, uh, the other thing I can mention is that often you see CIPs in, in communities where there's a downtown core. And so it was created because the uh, businesses in the downtown area often are in very old buildings and in disrepair. And uh, because of the age of the community, people tend to keep them nostalgic by helping their business owners uh, help the exterior of the stores. We did something like that with the Honey Harbor Town Center this year with some municipal, uh, with some Main Street funding that just sort of came down the pipes. It was very well received. We have more projects we could do if there were, uh, if there was an interest in a CIP. So hopefully that helps. So just to loop uh, through you, your worship, the 30,000 is to develop a plan. It is not to distribute this money to businesses. Uh, actually, on the contrary, it is uh, to help businesses. We can do the plan in-house. Oh. I was going to say, that's a lot of that's deal. Thank you. So no, we can create it with our own uh, staff here and be able to present you with one that's similar to what other municipalities are doing. So you have not made a presentation to us on this? No, I haven't. And I will if, you, if it's the will of council. It's just really outside of a bureaucratic level to 
to make these kind of decisions uh, when we're getting asked from the community. And so I'm coming to you to let you know the state of affairs that are, are occurring in our marinas, in our uh, small retails. And if there is an opportunity for 50% funding, I think you're gonna get some applications and some uptake. I'm wondering if it makes sense to ask you to make a presentation to us in December. And at that time for us to decide whether or not we wanna do this funding. Well, I, I hope I didn't shoot myself on the foot. We can do it in-house. It will take a little bit of time. And uh, like many of your senior team, I'm limited. Uh, I have to take some vacation eventually this year. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to have time. To <laughs> uh, through your worship, I do not think that council is asking for the completed plan. They just want more information. Well, I mean, the, 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 my concern, and I, I'm seeing a few heading up, my concern is um, it's not that I'm against the idea. I don't think I know enough about the idea to decide how much I'm in favor of it. Okay, well, then keep, Mr. Uh, your, your Worship, if that is what uh, you want, uh, what is identified by the CAO, I can provide you back a report in December that gives you an idea of uh, what it would be like. Um, I can do that. I yes. mean, I don't want to speak for the rest of council without giving them a chance to speak, but that, that, was, that was my concern. Council? I got a thumbs up. And then, and then all, it's another thumbs up. Also, my pictures moved for some reason. <laughs> okay, so can we, can we leave, put this on hold until next month? I, I, I want to tell us that at this point, we're over $150,000 of potential savings with, I think, a target of 100, if memory serves. So we've given Julie more than enough to work with. Councillor Cooper. We just got a huge raise. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, 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 don't, I don't think our salaries is a percentage of budget. <laughs> Councillor Bocek. So my understanding is we're going to, we're going to defer this till next month and Jennifer's going to come back with a, a presentation and then we're going to make a decision on it. Is that, is that where we're headed? With regards to the $30,000 uh, CIP, yes. Okay. I'm in agreement with that. Okay. Um, now I'm going to try to read a resolution here that I'm probably going to mess up, but I'm going to do my best given the, all the discussion we've had. This happens to be moved by Councillor Bocek, seconded by Councillor Douglas. Be it resolved that Council receives a 2021 budget draft number two or three. Which draft were we on? Two. And that Council agrees that the capital levy should be aligned with the capital contributions from the tax levy in the operational budget and direct staff to realign the levies according to, accordingly. And that Council Council directs staff to change the following. Reduced the, MT, the McTeer Community Development Association Gazebo Mississippi Activity Park to $10,000. That's from 40. Reduced the Cognition Community Church Dock Replacement Fund to $5,000. That's from the 10. Reduced the Georgia Bay General Hospital funding to $5,000 again from the 10. Reduce the funding for Georgian Bay Forever Divert and Capture to $5,000 and that's from 15. Reduce funding for Georgian Bay Great Lakes Foundation to $20,000, that's from 25. Reduce the contingency to $4,000 for grants and donations. That's from six. Reduce the council endeavors by $50,000 to $50,000. So that was cut that in half. Remove the summer youth program outsourced for $30,000. Remove the summer recreation grants of $5,000 because of course we're carrying forward the unspent from this year. Um, yeah, I think that's it. 
we're, we're leaving on hold the SSE, SSEA Honey Harbor Fund and the CIP Fund to, based on further reports that we might receive. Councilor Wienko. I believe you missed the Frag Midas one. Well, the Frag Midas, we left at 25. So therefore, was increased. Oh. it's already in the budget at 25. Okay. And actually, when I say reduce the divert and capture to five, it was in the budget at 25. So we're, act we're actually saving $20,000 there. Sorry, my mistake. Oh, and re reduce, uh, suspend the, uh, suspend council COLA of, of up to $4,600. And I'm not doing all the math here, but I think that all adds up to about $156,000 or something. And 600? Yes. Okay. On the button. <laughs> so we have allowed Ms. Butia to cut the budget significantly. What this will mean, I suspect, after she's crunched through all the numbers, we actually might have a small surplus that we'll have to put into a reserve. But we'll see after you, you re crunch the numbers, Ms. Butia. We will just be reducing how much we pull from the working fund okay. reserve. Which will, in, in effect, have this, the same. Result. Correct. Okay. All those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. Now it's almost four o'clock. We have, let's see, where are we here? We have three more items to go through, um, including a draft procedure bylaw, which might take a lot of time, but let's see how we do because. I believe by 4.30, we have to vote on extending our time if we're not done, is that correct? Unless anybody needs a bio break. All right, let's keep going. Electric vehicle chargers at 99 Lone Pine Road. Ms. Schneier. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. This is a initiative that came to us uh, from a company who has uh, uh, received funding from Enercan, which is a uh, federal agency that is supporting, uh, in partnership with the province, um, 180 chargers across the entire province. And uh, luckily, we are uh, being considered as a location along the 400 corridor because we are uh, a middle of the halfway destination between Barrie and Perry Sound. It's also um, a really great uh, location because it's well lit. Uh, there are lots of uh, traveling public amenities on exit 156. And uh, so in one of the problems that we were facing was um, Petro Canada is already at its maximum capacity in terms of number of spaces that they're willing to be able to provide for the uh, electric vehicle, char vehicle charging station and Raj across the street at the Port Severn SO is unable to give up parking spaces. So uh, staff have been bringing this around and we did check with legal. We could have um, a location at 99 for up to three level three charging stations. Um, so long as we go through the uh, open, fair and transparent RFP process. And so today I'm uh, coming forward to you asking if we can go ahead and do that and uh, see who else is out there that could provide uh, electric vehicle charging stations at the level three capacity and be able to offer them to our residents in a safe, well-lit area. They can get access to the Wi-Fi while they are here and then they're also able to walk to various locations. So as a reference, if you drive a um, Ford Mustang Mach-E, you would be able to charge uh, your car at a level three charger in 40 minutes or less. So in that time, you can plug in, you can go and check out a restaurant, you can uh, use the Wi-Fi, and you can also head up to Petro Canada or go for a walk in the park. All of these amenities are at uh, a stone's throw away from using them, having them at 99 Lone Pine, let alone our residents that we've seen in our parking lots when they come for council or committee of adjustment. There are many electric vehicles there and we don't offer charging at this time. 
Well, would employees be allowed to use these stations? Yes, there's no incentives for staff or employees that are offered uh, through these charging stations. You'd be able to use them uh, just as you would be able to use the one at that is at uh, 35 Lone Pine. The only thing is there only is one at 35 Lone Pine. The other chargers that you see there are level twos. So that same car would be about four and a half, five hours. Thank you. Councilor Rianco. I'm just curious. You say that uh, no cost to us for installation. Um, and there's no maintenance fees for us to do anything, and there's no income. So how much do these charges cost? And does the income go back to this company that's putting them in for free? Is that the way it works? So what is it? It does cost? go back to the company. It does go back to the company. It depends on your charging. So you can do three uh, dollars for every kilowatt hour of charging that you can uh, uh, use at a a level two charger and sometimes it's up to $15 per hour for level three charging. It depends honestly on the connection and the rate and time of day. So they are responsible to install, they're responsible to uh, maintain. It'll be part of a green lots uh, uh, organization that will take care of them if they, if they end up, if there ends up being a reason that they require uh, any type of maintenance that will all happen here and uh, they would eventually be able to recoup the costs for the charging stations and you know possibly even be able to break even okay so you use a credit card i assume to to, to purchase your 40 minutes or whatever um question is, is how busy how is the one at petro canada because again i don't live in port seven but I don't, I've never seen any cars and they're charging. Uh, are they actively being used or how yeah. busy are those ones? Yes, so on my phone, I have a PlugShare app and you can see this level three charger on PlugShare and you can also see it on ChargePoint. And people that come into the uh, charging station tend to use PlugShare to check in if they remember and uh, share stories about um, whether the snow is removed or whether the charger is broken. It's sort of like a, like a, uh, an underground network for electric vehicle chargers. So on here, you can see that people do use the charger, the level three charger, it's the preference over the level two. Uh, those are the type of comments that we see on here. And uh, it's well used, it's not, there's not a lineup because what happens is if the level three is, uh, in use, they can go to level two and then switch over to the level three. So um, we, we don't have a lineup, but at the same time, it's not stagnant. I live down here permanent full time and I see cars on them frequently. And um, so that's why I think it's a good idea that we move uh, a couple more chargers into our community at exit 156. The uh, competition is to move them to exit 147, and that doesn't do us any good uh, in terms of bringing uh, the right kind of traffic here and spending dollars at our commissary at exit 156. Council Jarvis. Yeah, uh, I, like the, I like the idea. Um, don't forget, we've also got a library and a historic park there as well that people can visit. Um, my concern was, if I read things correctly, it sounded like the chargers would be going towards the back of the parking lot over towards the uh, maintenance sheds, or did I have that wrong? You don't have it. So out in the back of the community services building, just to the, uh, to the right, heading towards the path to the fire hall, there are four or five spaces just outside of a green box that's surrounded by shrubs, and that's the transformer, and it will go right there. And then to re and be the reason why it'll go there, it's much more cost effective to run a, a separate meter off of that transformer for phase three power. And uh, then the alternate replacement would be to take those three spaces and put them right in front of Jess's office. Uh, okay. Um, so the, 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 the charging would be right there, the shorter the distance. Uh, I mean, electricity is lost the further distance you go from its source. So that's good as well. I presume there would be pro appropriate signage provided and that would be financed by whom? Because it would be financed by the company. So we put that in the RFP that they would need to tell us their signage plan. 
uh, with the company that we have been working with, they'll put up signage along the 400. They'll be visible by the 400 and it won't take long for people to catch them because they'll be on this, as I mentioned, this underground network that sort of exists with electric chargers. If you're familiar with Waze or Google Maps, most more specifically Waze where people populate it with information, it's very similar to that. Okay, thank you. Oh. Okay, I, I don't think I'm seeing other hands. The resolution reads, be it res moved by Councillor Bocek, second by Councillor Douglas, be it resolved the council directs staff to issue a request for proposal for up to three electric vehicle charging stations to be placed at 99 Lone Pine Road and accept a bid that best matches the needs of the community. All those in favor. Councilor Bocek, was that a vote or a question? Uh, you're muted. It was a question of clarity, but I am voting in favor of the resolution, so we can move What's on. What's your question? My question was, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with electric vehicles and I know that there's home charging stations. So our residents can charge from their homes, if, if I'm not mistaken. So, and we do have charging units at the Rally Lodge and, 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 and other spots. So this is to attract tourism to our core area so that they come in and spend money is, is the gist of it? Kind of, but it's also because these chargers are level three. Raleigh has level two chargers. All home chargers are level two chargers I so that you plug your car in at night and you go to bed, you wake up and it's charged right. and you can do it on well, what used to be off peak hours. Uh, there is only one level three charger from Barry to Perry Sound. And uh, we would like to add a couple more because that's the future of the electric car industry. Yeah, it's always being used over there. The level two is not, but the level three is always being used. It's, it's, it's funny. You see Tesla operators running the level twos, but um, I think we're going to have a solution for that in the coming months. Thank All you. right. Did I take the vote? Yes. Okay. So that's carried. I thought I did. To our clerk, we're on a draft procedure bylaw. Roughly 65 pages worth. <laughs> Approximately. Um, so there's the draft that I provided that I believe included all the comments and requests from our meeting in October. And if everyone is agreeable, I'm hoping that can be passed today. All right. So then if I can get my mouse to work, the question is, Councillor, oh, CEO Gunby. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify with members of council, it, just in the essence of time, um, mm -hmm. we're aware there, there might be spelling or grammatical errors in this document, but we're just focusing on the meat and potatoes of it. So if you don't bother pointing those out, we'll look at those when this is all done. Thank you. Councilor Jarvis. Well, actually I have a s slew of small stuff. So I will, I will definitely take your, uh, your notes, uh, Jessica, to heart on that. I do have, uh, I want to go right to the end. Um, Karen, if that's all right, and, and to the beginning, I guess the whole thing. Um, so we're reinstating Council of the Whole in this, correct? Correct, but it won't be part of our regular schedule. It'll, it'll be part of an, an as-needed basis. So when something needed to go to Committee of the Whole, then it will. So when we talk about in Schedule L on page 31, we talk about open forum. Is that in place of cow in, or how is that going to work? So it's not in place of cow at all. And previously, open forum was only on cow. And I'm recommending and has it been through all the drafts that it's included in council and cow. OK, uh, I'm going to bop around a bit to see if you can follow me because I was getting confused by a few things. Page four, item 21. Uh, you talk about a special rule of debate to extend the rules of debate. I'm not sure I understand that. Sorry, what page are you, are you on? Page four, item 21. That's, that's when we soften the rules. Normally, once we've gone through two rounds, I can call the vote. Correct. So it's called the special rule of debate 
to extend the rules of debate. That's the official terminology. Wow. Okay. Um, okay. I fine if that's the way the terminology is supposed to go. Um, uh, page seventeen. Item two, uh, bylaws C. I'm just going there myself. Uh, we talk about. Sorry, are you on the final version or the draft version? I'm on the version you set us in the uh, which on the agenda. There's both. There's the draft version. Does it have yellow highlights? Oh my god. Hang on. That'll change the page numbers. <laughs> Lovely. I was on the oh uh, draft. Sorry, my my bad. I will reread the uh, final one and uh, I'll bring back anything I, I need to uh, be email. Okay. I spent a lot of time reading that sixty six pages of the draft. <laughs> yeah, it, it felt repetitive at times, didn't it? Uh, well, yeah. Um, it was just because we read you read a lot of sentences twice. Yeah. Uh, okay. My apologies for taking up the time. I will. Um, I think I have. I'll send off an email to you later. Okay. Any other comments? Councillor Hazelton. Yeah, I'm. I'm a little concerned that we're trying to rush this, and I did have a bunch of uh, points, uh, somewhat similar to uh, Councillor Jarvis. Um, so I'm a little concerned that uh, I'm going to be uh, trying to get answers to all of these items without, um, uh, with a lot of pressure to race through them. So um, I don't know what you want to do on that front, but um, well, we can defer the whole thing. We've taken we've taken all day for this meeting, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and therefore. We're, we're, we're kind of squeezed. Ms. Gunby, you want to speak. I can tell you. I just want to say that this is the third time now we've brought this to council. So it's, it's just unfortunate that every meeting there's more in four, four times. Great. Um, there, there's more and more and more suggestions that the clerk has asked to be submitted to her prior so she could include it in the agenda so we could all review it as opposed to coming to the meeting and then having an hour and a half long conversation again with more ideas. So if the mayor does want to defer it and you do have some additional suggestions, we can definitely talk about them. I just pointed out if you see that there's a typo, there's no point in talking about that because we can see that ourselves. But if it's, again, it's of the will of council, if you want to defer it for more information. Can I have a follow up? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'm not coming up with suggestions. I'm looking for clarification. So I fully understand what we are approving. And, um, and that's what I'm concerned about is uh, if we try to rush through it, um, uh, I, this is an extremely important document, and I think um, I think it would uh, it'd be inappropriate for us to rush through it. I would much prefer to uh, if uh, our clerk has the uh, code of conduct uh, available uh, at that special meeting, we could uh, deal with both of them. Councilor Bocek, followed by Councilor Cooper. Not to stray too far off topic, but this is exactly what cow is for. Cow is to have these discussions at length, informally, you sort out all the stuff and then bring it to council in order for council to make a decision. Then we're not discussing this four times and no decision. So it's a very good point why cow is so important so that we can have this discussion. And when the discussion's over, then it's a five minute deal at council to vote on it to say yes or no. So this just strengthens my case and why we should have cow. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm out. <laughs> did you acknowledge me? Yes, I did. Thank you. Uh, I didn't hear that very clearly, but uh um, Jarvis is laughing. <laughs> <laughs> what else is it? Never mind. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I we've got to get this right. It's, that's the most important thing. And I know that there's frustration and uh, on behalf of our CAO and our clerk, and I apologize for that. But I, I do really think that this is a critical document. And I also agree with Councillor Bocek that it, the perfect place for this would be in a specially called cow meeting so that we can get through these documents 
uh, I think we need to hear from each other that we're going to learn from each other. And so that would be my suggestion for the two documents that are we're working on, shall we say. And um, anyway, I'd like to get it right. Thank you. All right. It's, it's, it's frustrating as I'm also finding this. We're going to call a special council meeting. We'll call it cow to make some people happy. I don't care if we call it pig. And um, so I'm going to say to the clerk and to the CAO, here we go again. Um, let's see when, who's available and when. Sorry, am I making my mean face? Does yes. pig stand for, stand for politicians in government? No. Yes. And, and they don't, and they rarely fly. <laughs> I'm seeing ste steam come out of the ears of our CAO. Yeah. <laughs> that happens all the time. <laughs> you get used to it eventually. So it's, it's, it's after four o'clock and it's clear that the number of council uh, counselors are not prepared to hit the favor in favor button. And therefore I don't think it's even worth starting at this point. So let's go on to item J, which is lease of Honey Harbor Park Landing. To our clerk. Um, so obviously this building has been leased out to the business and the real estate agency that's been there for several, several years. Oh, um, our CEO wants to interrupt. Councillor Bocek, you need to leave, please. Oh, yes. Thank you for that reminder. I think having his screen blocked is sufficient because he could still hear it even if he was public. Am I, am I, this is not closed session, so am I not allowed to remain and hear but cannot comment? Correct. And I would turn off your video. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. Now, back to our clerk. So Thank you for the, the reminder, Ms. Gunby. Yes, the um, the lease expires the beginning of next year. I think it's January thirty first, um, and they've had a few asks they would like to remain, but there's a few things that they've requested that be changed within that lease agreement. Um, some of them are more substantial than others. So, what I'm looking for is direction from council that you want us to engage in negotiations to continue leasing out that building, and for staff to take the time to research if some of the asks are even feasible or reasonable at this point in time. So really all we're doing is approving that you negotiate. Correct. We're not, we're not approving or disapproving any consequences of those negotiations. Correct. But you said that the lease expires in January? Yes. I thought it had another year to go or am I missing something here? It's January 2021, I believe. Maybe. Oh, okay. Council, is there any reason we should not allow staff to negotiate and see what they can learn? Councillor Hazelton, followed by Councillor Cooper. So, um, if the question is, do we ask staff to negotiate? I have no problems with that. Um, what I would like to uh, introduce here uh, as a, what I think is a, a very key topic is um, uh, when the Honey Harbor CAG was formed, uh, there was lots of discussion about what um, needed to happen in the hamlet of Honey Harbor to drive business, to drive expansion, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, there, the, the, uh, the Honey Harbor CAG is populated by a lot of the uh, business owners in the, uh, the downtown core of the Hamlet. Um, and they all identified the park landing as a visionary purchase by the township years and years ago, which was intended to be a cornerstone for the, for the growth um, of the community of, uh, uh, of the Hamlet of Honey Harbor. Um, so with that all being said, um, I would suggest that um, uh, what we should be thinking about here, um, first of all, renewing the lease for a couple of years, absolutely, we, nothing's gonna happen in a couple of years. But I think what we wanna be doing here is um, understanding the visions that the, uh, these leaders from our community and the Honey Harbor CAG uh, were, were talking about uh, and engaging them to give us some direction 
on what really should be done in the hamlet of Honey Harbor. Um, and given that this is a township facility, um, we want to understand how this could play into their vision. And so uh, my recommendation here is absolutely renew the lease um, and uh, you know, give, give uh, us a minimum of a two year window, uh, but aggressively engage the Honey Harbor CAG uh, to start thinking about what uh, they wanna do with all of these great ideas that they'd started put out there um, and then find out if those ideas involve this uh, park landing and the building or if they don't. And if they don't, fine, we can continue to lease it out to other, other ventures. But if it turns out that the Honey Harbor CAG believes that this is a kind of a cornerstone for focusing growth and expansion um, and attracting people into the hamlet, then we, I don't think we want to go for another eight year lease like we had in the past uh, and lock ourselves out of enabling that building if it is in fact uh, a cornerstone of that strategy. So uh, hopefully that's uh, some useful comment. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Well, thank you, uh, Mayor Kutsir. And I, I, uh, I think that the thoughts um, that Councillor Hazelton has are very good in terms of having the flexibility, uh, at least in the immediate future, uh, and that could come from how we negotiate this lease. And perhaps it's a two-year lease with a one-year renewal after that, um, so that there's some sort of stability for the current tenant, but on the other hand, give us some flexibility. The other thing I was gonna suggest is in terms of, um, uh, I, I don't know how much work has been done on sort of the market itself, but uh, I think it's important for us to make sure that um, we understand what the going rate is for a lease of this nature. Um, and uh, so I would encourage that as well. Uh, and, um, but happy to support this resolution from the perspective of, of uh, starting negotiations. But I really do like the idea of having that flexibility that uh, Councillor Hazelton is uh, talking about. Thank you. Any other comments? The resolution reads, moved by Councillor Jarvis, seconded by Councillor Wienko, be it resolved that Council receives the Clerk's Report 2020-27 regarding the lease agreement for Unit 1 of Honey Harbor Park Landing, and that staff be directed to enter negotiations with Remax Baywatch Limited to review the terms of the lease agreement for Unit 1 of 2587 Honey Harbor Road. All those, Councillor Cooper. Are, are we giving direction in terms of the term and so forth? I don't think we need it in writing, but I can definitely take it under advisement. Any final agreement will come back, so. Thank you. All those in favor? And that is carried. And so Mr. Bocek can be invited back. Good, can glad I to see my wife and I still have a job. <laughs> can I request that we have a motion to extend past 4.30? I know there's only one item, but we only have 10 minutes. Okay. Um, Would you like me to read it? Sure, that'd be the easiest. Be it resolved that council waive the rules of procedure to extend past 4.30 and no later than 6 p.m. And I would like a mover and a seconder, please. Thank you. All those in disfavor. And that's carried. Thank you. So now we go on to new business. We've already taken care of item B. So it's item A, Brandy's Cove, the audience center request for reimbursement. Okay. And who, Ms. Lemieux, you've appeared, so you're going to give us the, the backstory on this. I can give you a quick rundown, yes. So Please. a letter was received by Brady's Cove Yachting Center, um, essentially uh, stating a request to council to um, have a reimbursement for a payment of $3,500 that was provided by uh, Brandy's Cove to the township 
um, to cover the costs of the peer review that was done by Cambium. Um, and I just wanted to quickly share my screen if you uh, don't, oh, host has it disabled. I don't know if Karen can change that, but I just wanted to um, quickly show council on the fee schedule um, where staff was coming from, from requesting these fees uh, before you make a decision, so. You should be able to share now. Sorry, Victoria. Thank you. Uh, here we go. So hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Uh, so this is the planning excerpt from the uh, fees bylaw that was passed in 2019 uh, by council. And I just wanted to bring your attention here to the site plan section where it states engineering review of site plan application or plans for approval um, and at cost. So based on this fee structure, uh, this is why staff did request the $3,500 to come from uh, Brandy's Cove. So again, just wanted to give council that information before you made a decision on the um, requested reimbursement. Okay. Um, could you also perhaps for us review the timeline? Because isn't that their argument? Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, to your worship, the timeline that was given um, is essentially just, you know, providing the time that we then asked for um, the fee to be covered. This was not initially um, asked back in, you know, 2017 when things were begun to be submitted. Um, and as someone who was, um, I, you know, it wasn't my main file, but I was um, included enough in discussions that it didn't really become apparent until uh, May of this year that a peer review of this sort it was in the best interest of the township to um, to be conducted. So that is why it was later approached to them for that fee, um, which was outlined to them um, verbally and through email, I believe, um, from uh, Mr. Robinson to the owners. So um, the timeline that is stated, um, nothing is a shock to me in any way, uh, but just for council's information, the reason why it was a bit later on when we asked for that fee is because until that time, it didn't seem um, like we did require peer review, again, until after things started to come in front of council and staff um, did more of a review with the CBO, et cetera. And we, and we felt like we needed um, more of a professional opinion from an outside source at that time. Okay, I believe I saw Councilor Rianko's hand. What's this issue? What's this issue with Macy Bay? Did we make an exception to Macy Bay or? or... How am I reading this uh, this letter? I was going to say I hope CAO Gumby can fill that in because <laughs> I'm not totally sure. Thanks. I I saw the brief look of confusion on your face. So all they're doing is they're sort of quoting um, what we said regarding Macy Bay. So because we initiated the peer review for Macy's Bay, we wanted it for ourselves, we paid for it. So they are stating that because we initiated the peer review for Macy Bay and we paid for it, we initiated theirs by asking them give us one. So they think we should pay for that one as well. So that's the only reason they're referring to Macy Bay. But that sounds great, but so that's, so if, me, if, if, we, if we pay for Macy Bay, why are we paying for Brandy Island? What's the difference? Where's the because difference here? The township asked for it, like council asked for it, if I remember correctly. So that is why the township paid for it. Like we- Okay, so the township asked, the, the council asked for a uh, peer review of Macy Bay, therefore mm -hmm. we pay for it. Yes. And who asked for the peer review for Brandy Island? Staff requested it as part of the application. Council wanted it sort of to satisfy their own concerns with Macy Bay. Right. So that's and why- for Brandy Island. Island. Okay, so Brandy Island, who asked for it? It Staff. wasn't council. Who? Staff. Who? Staff. You're muted again. Or... Okay. Um, Council Hazelton, followed by Council Bocek, followed by Cooper, followed by Jarvis. Sorry, I was sneezing away there. Um, do I have a couple of uh, comments here? Um, I guess I'm, um, I'm intrigued with uh, date omissions uh, and perhaps um, Victoria, you could uh, elude or, or fill in the blanks here. What was the date of the site plan application? 
You might have to give me a few seconds here to, to look okay. back. Okay. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to suggest that the site plan application was either uh, late 2019 or early 2020. Um, and I'm not sure what the relevance of the 2017 date is, but to, to the information that you have provided us, uh, Victoria, um, it certainly seems to me that if uh, the site plan application was initiated uh, and your fee structure um, allows for a recovery of um, uh, peer reviews, then, uh, then that is all part of that. On the Macy Bay side of things, uh, I'm not quite sure exactly why that's being pulled in, but um, certainly on the Macy Bay, as I understand it, um, there were uh, a couple of rounds of peer reviews uh, on all of the things related to Macy Bay, and uh, my understanding is that was all covered by Macy Bay as part of the, uh, the structure here. So I'm not quite sure what uh, peer review the township funded. Um, perhaps uh, CEO Gunby could help us understand what that peer review was for, because um, my understanding is all of the peer reviews for all of the items related to the OMB decision were all funded uh, uh, under contract by Macy Bay. Honestly, I don't have that exact answer for you right now. Um, it's unfortunate that Macy Bay was dragged in with this letter because I fear that the conversation is going to head that way. Um, so I would just like to stick with this one and treat it as its own application as opposed to the Macy Bay one. But I will look into that and get you that answer, Councillor Hazelton. Thank you. I mean, I, I do think that they are uh, independent, uh, that we, uh, we should not be connecting those dots. Um, I think... Uh, our uh, manager of planning, uh, Victoria, has done an excellent job of giving us uh, the facts of what we are uh, entitled to do. Uh, and we have just done what we are entitled to do. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up to uh, the date received of the application was February 19th of this year, 2020. So of, the, of this specific site plan that the peer review um, was in regards to. Councilor Bochek. My question is for Victoria. Victoria, what was your reason for asking for the peer review? We are not the governing body. We do not issue um, uh, approvals for anything on the septic system except for the site plan. So my question to you is, if you requested the peer review, and we are not the approval agency, uh, wh why did we need the peer review? Uh, through your worship, Councillor Bocek, that's a great question and I'm going to be completely honest with council. I was not part of the decision to initiate this peer review. I was not part of that original conversation. So I don't want to speak out of turn. Um, I'm just aware of when it was asked for, et cetera. Okay, so if I'm a business owner and I have already sought approval from the MECP and the MOE and, and got it, and then the local township requested a peer review when they don't have anything to do with the approval because the approval has already been given, the go ahead is already there. If I was that person, I would be coming after the township for that money as well because it seems to me like it was asked for. We don't know the reason as council why it was asked for. Um, and I would think it shouldn't have been asked for because we are not the approval body for that, for that uh, file. Okay, um, Councilor Cooper. A very interesting discussion. Uh, I think, uh, Victoria, uh, thanks for all this information. And I um, I guess really what I'm trying to understand here is if, if this is our practice, and it's a practice that we've used elsewhere with other applications, it's, it's the normal course of events that we might, in some cases and not, not in others, ask for a peer review. Uh, it's our purview is my understanding to ask for one and ask and request that it be paid for. So is there something different that we're doing in this particular case or not? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Cooper, not that I'm aware of, um, but again, if, if there are a few members of council who are looking for some additional information about that, I'd be happy to circle back um, at, a, at a subsequent meeting. Um, 
but yeah, otherwise, uh, you know, the, the fee schedule is there for a reason. Um, those types of engineering things that would be reviewed or would be need to be reviewed for site plans typically would, again, in our township relate to septic systems and, and things of that uh, nature, because, you know, typically those are really the big engineering um, issues that we would have in our township based on our servicing structure. Uh, so in, in my experience, I think that's a pretty normal um, ask, but I can also understand um, Councillor Bocek's question to that. So again, if it's the will of council, I'd be happy, happy to circle back if required. Thank you. And Councillor Jarvis. Um, I, I think it's pretty cut and dry from my perspective. Um, we requested that Brandy Scove provide a peer review uh, and they would be paying for it as part of our fee structure. They did, that was done, case closed. I don't see anything else that needs to be discussed on this. Um, I think we just, that's the way it is and uh, they have to live with that. All right, well, we have two choices here. I can read the, I have in front of me a resolution which ends with either does or does not approve the reimbursement of the three and a half thousand dollar fee. So we can either read this resolution and see which way it goes, or we can get further information if that is necessary. Um, but I think if really the only outstanding thing is here because Ms. Lemieux is not the one who requested the peer review. Um, we don't, we haven't heard the rationale as to why the peer review was requested. But having said that, um, if staff wanted a peer review, you'd think that'd be within their purview to ask for one. Um, Councilor Bianco. It, it says here in the first paragraph that the peer review was conducted in June, 2020. It's not that long ago, we should be able to remember who requested it. If it wasn't our staff, who, who requested it? Was it Jamie's group or, or what? Uh, so through your worship to Councilor Rianco, um, yes, sorry to clarify, uh, it was MHVC who was the main point on this file. So they uh, were the body that was part of the conversation to request that. Okay, so they're staff, I guess. So. Staff requested it. Mm -hmm. Councilor Bocek, followed by Councilor Jarvis. You know, this is the last I'll speak to this, but uh, further to my, my other points, I think there's a very good case to be made that, um, that um, the peer review uh, was an unnecessary step because the approval was already granted. And I don't know where this will end up. It could end up in litigation. It could end up anywhere. Um, and we all know what lawyers charge. They're not free. Um, council can make a decision based on the information they have. Um, but I fear we could be spending a lot more money in the end. Just my thoughts. Every councilor can vote for themselves. Councillor, I think, uh, well, Councillor Douglas, you haven't spoken to on this yet. Uh, thank you. I'm Victoria, can you just, I, maybe this was already said and I've missed it or something, but why was there a peer review asked for this to be done on this to begin with? Uh, so they unsatisfied with the reports that were initially done or was there? Uh, so through your worship to Councillor Douglas, um, that's the piece that unfortunately I'm, I, I, I would not like to comment on to council because I was not part of the initial conversations as to why that was triggered. And that is something that I could come back with um, to council if, if you prefer. Um, I just, I don't wanna comment on a conversation I wasn't part of. Okay, fair enough, I understand that. But I think in order for me to make any kind of decision on this, I, I would like to know why there was a peer review um, requested I, and to begin with, I mean, I. I don't know. I, I, I don't think we can just randomly be asking for things without knowing why, why it was being asked for. I mean, if there was a good reason for it or if it had come to council with some sort of request through us that, you know, you were unsatisfied with documents and you were requesting a peer review. I think that's an important piece of information that we should know before we make any decision on this personally or I, before I can make a decision anyways. I, I would agree in that, that I would like to know the review performed by Cambium how much of it was addressing the site plan 
versus the design of the system itself. Because that would make quite a difference in my mind as to my attitude towards this. Councillor Hazelton. Thank you for that. I think what, um, what would be helpful, certainly for me, um, is in the response uh, from our planning department, uh, Victoria, uh, that we understand uh, what all is involved and relevant uh, in the approval of a site plan. And uh, I read in our official plan uh, lots and lots of verbiage of uh, you know, things that need to be respected, things that need to be considered uh, with any development uh, in a uh, site plan that is changing that site plan. And so uh, it really doesn't matter uh, from my perspective whether there, there's an ECA from uh, MECP or not. Um, we are still, as a township, responsible within the concept of a site plan for ensuring the environmental safety of that, uh, uh, that property and the impacts of that property on the environment around that property. And so uh, I think we have to be very careful that we don't dismiss our responsibilities by saying, wait, hey, MECP approved something it, that has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with us. And the fact that we have site plan control extensively um, um, uh, uh, used in commercial and residential properties in our township, we have placed an enormous weight on the value of a site plan and the, cons and the considerations of a site plan. And so I think what is important then is not only to get the other questions that have been asked here, but if we can get them asked and responded to in the context of, and perhaps educate us, if you would, Victoria, on what the site plan concept is intended to do and what our responsibilities of council are as we consider a change in a site plan, because ultimately that is the question. And I believe very strongly that the request for a peer review was to give us a clear understanding, if possible, uh, on the impacts of the requested change in the site plan on the community and the environment around the, the property uh, and not just uh, the trivialization of, hey, it's you know, MECP approved and, and therefore we don't care or we don't have a role in this. I, I believe very strongly we have a role, but I would ask, Victoria, if you could educate us on that, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, to Robert. your and to council, I think I've made a, a number of notes here and it sounds like uh, the majority of council would like um, more of an actual opinion from staff. Um, in some sort of report, which I would be happy to do if that's the will of council today. Um, council Cooper. I'll be very, very brief and I, and that, that's, would in, I'd be very encouraged to have more information and, and as part of that, uh, and, and in relation to some of the things that were suggested by Councillor Hazelton, as, as a council, we are responsible for the environment in, in the area. And we also have known and do know that we've had issues with approvals being provided from MECP over the last five years. They're understaffed, there have been problems. And so I'd like uh, if you could perhaps provide us with a little bit of a background on that too. And this is another reason we'd have a peer review. So thank you. You, you know, Councillors, in the past couple of requests, you're going way beyond whether or not we should refund three and a half thousand. I mean, I'm, I'm not downplaying what your statements, but it is it's a, a significantly expanded project from what was actually in front of us. Councillor Jarvis, I happen to be in agreement, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's I think it's pretty simple here. We requested that the uh, proponents of this. Um, insulation provide a peer review. They provided a peer review. I don't know what the deal is here. The Macy Bay statement and there's a red herring as far as I'm concerned. They, re they provided what we requested and they were billed or they paid for it and they're trying to bill us back. I think it's goofy. You just say, no, you did what everything was done according to the way things should be done, period. Um, 
I think the best thing we can do is let Ms. LeVue give us a little more, more th Ms. Gunby. <laughs> Every time you just think it's over and I pull you back in. Um, You're as bad as a counselor. I know. Um, I So I emailed Jamie at MHBC asking him why the... Um, why it was asked for. And he stated that the reason for the peer review was to review the ECA application. Uh, and there was two reasons, two reasons to review the ECA in the context of the ECA, but also as it pertains to the site plan process that staff were administering and that council would have to consider. Um, it's reasonable that the township retained a consultant to review a matter that they do not have expertise in house to review. And it's reasonable that the applicant pay for the cost of the study. Okay, what I think is very important there is he's making it clear that he, as staff, requested this. It was not because of council, and they and staff believed it was an important part of their review before they came in front of council. There's also a resolution from March 9th that states uh, that the council did direct staff to retain a consultant to review the ECA application. And if required, provide comments on the ECA application. Okay, but did did he did they hire this consultant because of the council direction or because they felt it was necessary for their site plan review? How about we defer this? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of <laughs> Let, I hate to put it this way because, you know, I love to just make a decision and move on. But there is also a learning opportunity here. Mm -hmm. Councillor Bochuk, I would love to just defer, but I'm, you're, you, I'll let you speak. So if, if the applicant which they weren't an applicant because the application went to the provincial governing bodies, not us. No, but we, they applied for a site plan approval. That's right. So, so we requested a, a peer review. Now, if that peer review came back and the peer review was in a positive frame that said, yes, we've reviewed this and we have no issues with it. And council read that peer review and turned down or, 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 or did not, uh, approve the site plan agreement, um, I would be upset and I'd be asking for my money back too. If the peer review had, had have come up and said, nope, negative, this is a, a mess, uh, we can't put a septic system there, that's different. But if the peer review came back in a positive manner and, and the, the applicant figured, okay, well, there's your peer review, I'm going to get my uh, my site plan agreement and then the site plan agreement was turfed by by council I'd want my money back too so like I said you do what you want here in the way of voting on this but I know how I'm voting on this I'm about being fair Councillor Hazelton so <clears throat> we're not in a uh, in, in a an environment like committee of the whole where we have all these open discussions but uh, I will offer Councillor Bocek a comment here. Um, the uh, peer review came back very negative. Uh, and I think if I follow your logic, you were saying that if the peer review came back and supported it, and then council didn't approve the site plan, you'd be really upset. But I think the converse of that <clears throat> some must be true, which is if the peer review comes back very negative and council doesn't approve your site plan, that you would think that is also the right path to take. So I, I, I'm, I, I'm confused about why you're still uh, concerned with this. It sounds like uh, there's a somewhat of a consensus that this is the right thing to do, but I, I'm, I'm missing your logic and I would welcome the opportunity of, of learning uh, how you're thinking through it differently than the way I've just framed it based on what you've already said. Okay, Ms. Gunby. I was just going to say, are, are we deferring or are we going to continue to speak about this? I think we've spoken more than enough. Okay. Um, I think we'll defer because there's been a few questions that 
answers have been offered. And if we vote on it, then we'll never hear the answers. I'm happy to provide clarity at a subsequent meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the end of this meeting. Moved by Councilor Rienko, seconded by Councilor Bocek, be it resolved the council adopts bylaw 2020-094 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of November 10th, 2020 council meeting. All those in favor. And that is carried. And then we have be it resolved the council knows does now adjourn at 4.46 p.m. And it reads here until Tuesday, December 15th, 2020 at 9 a.m. or the call of the chair. And I'm thinking there might be a call of the chair uh, if we arrange for something in the meantime. Having said that, do note December 15th, 9 a.m. I will confess to all of you that I told staff that I was getting a little tired of starting at 10 o'clock. I thought nine o'clock was far more practical and they're willing to give it a shot subject to all the computer systems working. Is that daylight savings time or, or not? That's in whatever time zone we're in right now. <laughs> nine o'clock. Okay. Um, you know, for a year and a half, we always met at nine o'clock. To say nothing of, I don't know, decades. That was a long time ago. It was more than a year and a half. Yeah. <laughs> Councilor Bocek? Mr. Mayor, did you make mention of a special pig meeting that you were going to call? That's, uh, so you know, we haven't called it yet because we're trying to, we'll have to find out who's available when. Okay, so so we're just going with the, at the call of the chair as far as that yeah. special meeting goes. And what did, what did PIG stand for? Politicians in government. Oh. <laughs> I, I prefer the cow, the committee yeah. of the whole. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, we are, well, sir, all those in favor, I guess I should call the vote, shouldn't I? 